Hello, Professor. Hello, 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 everybody. The board is coming in. Give me a second. Good to see you all. This is it. You are in the right place for the last time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for saying so. I'm actually not. Oh, is that Allison? Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay. And good afternoon, Bradley. Okay. I'm looking. I'm just getting the board go. Here's the good board. afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, they're rocketed. Good afternoon, Samira. All right. Awesome. Hello. Excellent. Good afternoon. Hmm? Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, there's Valentina. Okay. Hang on. Okay. 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 I think we're all here. Okay. So. So yes, good. Oh, and sorry, I missed. I know I missed. I went out of order because I was doing the board. Good afternoon, Alexis. Hello, Penina. Good afternoon, Key. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, Juliana. Hello, Samantha D. Good afternoon, Dante S. Good afternoon, Bradley. Good afternoon, Michaela. Good afternoon, Samira. Good afternoon, Valentina. Good afternoon, Christina. All right, awesome, awesome. Okay. Oh, oh, good afternoon, Samantha M. Sorry. Good afternoon. Excellent. Okay. We, all right. So uh, good afternoon, Chris. Chris. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, I have to be quick. Okay. So this is our last class. You've gotten this, for, we're at the, we're at the end. I mean, we're going to, we have a finish line in sight, but we definitely need to sprint through that finish line, so to speak. Like it ain't over till it's over. And this is an unusual course in a way in that, in a way, the biggest dump of this course comes right at the end. Um, I'm always bizarrely the most intense right at the end. Hi, uh, or uh, hi, yes. So let me be very quick and well, as quick as I can be and say, um, I know you had practice today in the lab. I You could privately tell me how that went or anything about that later on. Um, I haven't heard anything, but okay, but Okay, what I'm trying to say is this, as quickly as I can. I think you all now have some sense of where you are in the course before you go into the final. Then you are, and you know, anybody who has any concerns or I had concerns about them, I tried to like privately like communicate with them. Everybody's still in the game. There, there, again, there's still lots of chance, lots of points and stuff to help you if you're not in a place that you want to be right now. Um, again, for those of you who need to do better on the final, if you do do better on the final, it will count more for you, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, again, the final will be posted like, I said eight o'clock tonight, which is weird because that's like right after this class, but that's what I said. So that's what I'm going to do, but that, well, I'm going to try to do, but the final will be posted tonight at eight. You'll have till, I think we said Friday night, midnight to do it. Let me be very super clear right now. It's going to be remarkable. However, today went in the lab. Whatever you think you know or don't know, I can tell you that the final will be remarkably, like more than usual, similar to what you saw in the lab and, you know, those questions and will be remarkably similar to the extra true false thing that maybe you noticed was just posted to you. The last fourth it was just posted to you um, in Google Classroom. Like your actual exam that's going to be posted tonight will be shockingly similar to 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 everything you expect like there there's not a lot of time for me to make a lot of changes okay for good or for bad now you may still not think you know a lot of the answers to whatever you did in the lab today i understand that but the good news is there'll be no surprises from here on in to consider today just an advanced leg up on what you have to figure out over the next two days let me say also um and I'm talking, I know, a little more frantically even than usual. I'm going to say that once I get rolling today with the physics, it is going to be intense physics for two and a half hours. Um, I want to preface, before I get going with the physics, I want to make sure we have a context in which to put it. So the deal is this. You're, anything, there's nothing more that you have to do nothing new mathematically that you have to solve for this course. I'm going to be saying a lot today to tie together all the material. For some of you, it'll go maybe thicker and faster than ever. For some of you, it will seem like what I say today is like, oh, wait, 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 hold, 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 hold on, hold on. Sorry, you didn't see. Wait, you didn't? Wait, okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, someone's sending me something important in direct chat. Okay, okay, let me, Um. okay, we're going to check in on this in a second. Okay, uh, thank you. Direct. There's only one person in the direct chat. So if you're in the direct chat, I, I see you and that's important. I'll check on that in a second. 
Well, okay, no, we might as well check on it right now. I believe if you guys look right now in the post in Google Classroom, that the place where your practice, right, wait, 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 right. Okay, oh, okay, wait, what? No, hold on. So people are saying, I appreciate all the feedback in the direct chat, but it seems like people are saying contradictory things. Okay, so hang on for a second. I believe that if you, I will check in a minute, but if you look in the posting, the original posting that we made yesterday where, where you found your, those three long response questions that you practiced in the lab today, I believe that very posting, which originally said something like three fourths of the exam or something, I believe if you look at the same posting again now, it was edited and there's a second link added to it. Right. Right. Okay. You should see that there's a Google form there. It does say it's no longer, well, wait. It, okay. 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 No, I appreciate all this. Okay. So there's a Google form there. There's a Google form. That's a true false thing. I'm going to address in a second. Yes, it probably says it's no longer accepting responses. That's true and should be the case because it's just for practice. You're not handing it in. But let me, but if you're saying, are you saying that the link, like, can you not even see the question? So, is it, is that so what initially when we open it, we get the no longer available, the no longer taking response. We didn't even see the question to begin with. Oh, you can't even see the questions. All right, then I'm going to change that right now. Fine. Okay, I apologize. I can change that right now. That wasn't my intent. Or I'm going to change it in like one second because I want you to be able to see the questions. I definitely want you to, uh, and you will in a minute. But I don't want you to hand it in, of course. That's practice, okay? What I want to make clear, so so just bear with me for a second. I will, I will like change the setting in a moment. But but here's the deal. The reason for this true false thing, like part of your final, you, you're going to have four questions on your final exam or four parts. The three things that you saw today in lab and then the 25 literal true false questions. Like they're literally true or false and no modify, like you don't have to do any, just true or false. Okay. It's a form as you see, as you will see. Okay. What I'm telling you now is that on your final exam, some way or another, you're going to end up doing two out of four of these questions. Like today in lab, you did two, right? You're going to do a total of two out of four of these. It's very possible that you won't literally choose two. It's very possible that I'll say one is required for everybody, such as the true false. Like that's generally what I've done in the past. It's very possible that the true false will be required for everybody. And then you'll choose one more of the other three. Like, like today you hopefully practice two of them, but you'll only, I, I think you see what I'm saying. In the end of the day, you're going to do two out of four questions for this final exam. It, it's possible that of those two, one might be a requirement. I, I'll just, I'm going to decide that honestly at the end of this class. Okay. But, but the point of this whole big true false thing is that everything, once I get going today, okay, yes, I'm, I'm going to post the questions in a second. I'm going to change the setting in a second. I won't start. I promise I will not start this class until it's clear that you can all see, see those true false. And as long as I'm saying this, I'm assuming, stop me for a moment. I'm assuming you did see and work on the other three questions today in lab. Even if you don't feel like you have final answers or you're not sure, you, you saw and worked on the other three long questions today in lab, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Valentina. Okay. Okay. So let me be as clear as I can. The purpose of the true false thing is that all the rest of the material, which is like super important and frankly, super exciting and sort of makes all the earlier material worth it in my judgment, everything I say for the next two hours, once I get started, all of what I say is hard and will go fast but I will not ask you to do any math about it at all. The way you're going to be held responsible for it or the way you, I want you to get the big conceptual picture of it. I mean, and it's conceptually hard enough. It is mathematical, but I want you to get the logic of everything I say for the next two hours. So what you're going to do in a minute, when I open that form, you're going to have it in front of you while I talk. And I'm not going to like necessarily explicitly refer to it. Sometimes I might, if I remember but basically, you're going to have it in front of you, and, and it's a way to help you listen to me talk. I will ultimately say things about almost every question there. Believe me, like I will. 
but you use that to follow along with me and to look for what you're looking for, okay? And you tick off answers for yourself while I'm talking. And then when I post the actual exam tonight, all those true false things, they'll probably be scrambled in their order. Maybe a word will be changed here or there just to keep you on your toes. But basically, like that's just to make sure that you pay attention today. And it's also to let you know in advance, you don't have to do any more math on anything I say today. It's really important to me that you get the conceptual connections of everything I say today and how it relates to the course. So, so the way we do this is, I'm just going to say this one last time to make sure it's clear and then I'm going to get going. Like, like once I open up that form and you have it in front of you, it'll sort of help you pay attention to what I'm doing. Then also, as you might have noticed, our final game turn to tonight, there's like a normal five point game turn just to say, like, if you participated or whatever. But then there's like a 30 point game turn for if for space for you to try to explain in any great way that you can, like what you got out of today. I mean, hopefully it's clear, but there's a 30 point opportunity you know, for you to just show that you got something out of today. That's another way to just sort of encourage you to hang in there for this last lecture. So one, so just know that's, don't be afraid that suddenly I'm going to throw some new question at you tonight. That's like really new and mathematically intricate. Don't listen today in that kind of a panicked way. Listen today to try to get how this all conceptually works together and the true false like sequence you know, it'll take me a while to, but once I start going, once you find the first place I'm at in that true false, you'll see I'm pretty much going to go in order and they'll start falling into place for you. Okay. So, and then that's the way you're, so you might all be required to do that true false, or maybe it'll be a choice, but you're going to end up doing two things on the final exam, two problems. It might be a requirement that you do that. And then you do one other problem, or maybe I'll loosen it because I know for some people, true false is too unusual or whatever, but you're going to end up doing two things tomorrow. Each of the two things, I mean, for the final exam, you'll do two out of the four things. Each one will be worth 50 points. Then the whole exam will be worth hundred. If you bomb the exam, but you did well in the midterm, then the midterm will count better, more for you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, wait, what's it? So is the yes me? Wait, yes. Okay. Okay. So, so, but all this is also to say, I just, again, like, I think you've been a great class. I think you're still all in the game. I know some of your midterm exam scores were like frustrating or disappointing to some of you. You're still all in the game. We have all these systems in place to try to have, including like that portal that says your best, just put a, whatever you think your best day was, or your best document. I don't care whether I graded it or not yet. Like just whatever you think shows your finest work, whether it was a midterm or a lab report, or something, you put it in there. It'll help me also remember how good you are. Everything in this system is designed to have you be judged by your best, not your middle, not your worst. Um, all of that stuff. So this last day, there's going to be a lot of physics to make your life in this class, I hope, worthwhile. But pay attention with your physics brain. Don't pay attention with your academically panicked brain. I'm still academically on your side and I want you to do well. I mean, all this is designed to have you walk away doing as well as you can with as much knowledge as you can. Um, so that's all that said. I think there's one other thing. All right, I'm going to say one other thing to get it out of the way. But again, the reason I'm like intense like this is like once I have your go ahead and once that document is visible to you, then again, you're going to know basically your final exam that's going to be posted tonight will be very similar to everything that's sitting in front of you. So you'll, so there won't be any surprises. So once I start going, please just try to hang with me with the physics. Trust me that it's intellectual. It's not an academic punishment. Um, and I will also ask you to be very careful about questions. Like if you want to ask me to go back and turn a page, sure, do that as always. But today would not be the day to ask like, like an interesting off topic question about like black holes or something. Like today would not be the day for that. Um, and I'm always available by cell phone and um, email for interesting things like that later. There's many of you I'll be very happy to write recommendations for when this is all over. Like I want to stay in touch, all of that. I'll be in my office physically on Tuesdays next semester, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm getting... All of this, and if there's and the grades are due Monday, so if you're concerned between now and then, you'll reach out to me personally. I'm just trying to get all that out of the way now because once I start, it's gonna be all about fit. Wait, oh, oh, right, okay, okay, okay. So there's a question the true false part 
There's no five-step method. There's no showing work. You're literally just going to, if you, if you are either forced to or choose to do that problem as part of your final exam, and, and you might be forced to, but if, if that true false thing is part of your final exam, all literally all you're going to do is tick true or false for each one of those sentences. You're not going to show any work at all. You're not going to do at all. Okay. So for some of you, that's a big relief. For some of you, that's scary. Like I know that. But the whole point of that, again, is I want you to get the concepts that I talk about today. So there's no five-step method for the true or false questions. I mean, I'm glad someone just asked that in the chat. Okay. And, and the other thing, it is scary, which is why it might be a choice. For some of you, it'll be a big relief, but for some of you, it's scary. I know. But I'm also, basically, today's whole lecture is the answer to those true false questions. Okay. So pay attention to it. Um, also, I still can't stop you from talking to each other before, like, you could still all help each other with this exam before Friday. That's still fair game. You can still go on the web and all that. But yeah, you have to, I mean, but yes, they are scary. And the one last thing about the true false is once you hit send, you know how Google Forms work. Once you submit it, it's submitted and that's it. So yes, on the one end, it's a lot. For some of you, it's a big relief. For some of you, it's very scary. And it's why it might be a choice. I, I can't guarantee that. But, but either way, it's the way you want to, but just know everything I say today, which is going to be heavy once I say it, you're not ever going to have to do any new math or solve new problems on. What you have to do is be able to answer those true false questions. So you'll pay attention to them in front of you while I do it. I don't mean to scare anybody. I mean to say, again, the goal is for everybody to get as high a grade as possible. There's no limit in my mind on the number of legitimate A's that can be given out, as long as they're legitimate. I'd love everybody to get an A. I have no problem with that. I think there's tons of you that really are gunning for an A in this class. I think you've been a wonderful group, seriously. And anybody who's a little shaky on the midterm, I'm still rooting for, and we've had private conversations about. So I'm rooting for all of you. Um, I don't want it to be scary, but but it is intense. It's a five-week course. like So we do have to go very fast today. Um, okay, and as long as we're talking about this, and I'm intense because I want to get the material, not because I'm trying to scare any of you or because I think any, like there's nothing bad with any of you. We just have to finish this course in two and a half hours, in two hours. So last thing also, I'm just going to say, some of you, I know your grade situation might be a little tenuous and you might really have to work hard on the final and you might have to choose your problem carefully or your problems carefully on the final. And you, I definitely encourage you to do a rough draft and then a final draft, like really be careful on the final if you're in that position. But at the same time, I'm going to tell you right now, because everybody has gotten their scores back for the most part, um, uh, except for weird situations. Um, um, it, if you know there's a situation, then you know there's a situation I've talked to or you've talked to me. I don't believe in negative surprises. So the one last thing I'm going to say, I don't know if you know this about me or if this was true in two or three, the one last thing I'm going to say, I don't want to make a big deal of it. I probably shouldn't even say it on the recording, but but if so, the, everything moves fast in this class and I have to get the grades in Monday, there's no flexibility about that. If the night before Monday, if suddenly I find out a huge negative surprise for one of you, if suddenly it looks like one of you is getting a D or an F and there was like no warning and I didn't see it coming and you didn't see it coming for whatever reason, like you rock the midterm, but then something disaster. Okay. If there's some big surprise the night before I have to submit the grades, I'm telling you right now, just so also you can breathe a little bit more easily. If I think I am surprised to see that you're about to get a D or an F or something, and I think you're going to be surprised and you didn't have a chance to rectify and we didn't have a chance to prepare ourselves for this reality, then what I will do is what I'm not supposed to do. And I will put an incomplete on the transcript, on the um, CUNY first. If you get an incomplete, even though that's supposed to mean you had a medical thing or something, that means I am telling you something is incomplete somewhere. Something didn't go. I have an incomplete understanding of your work or you have incomplete work somehow, or there was some disaster on the final. So if you get an incomplete, that means reach out to me so we can take steps to rectify the situation. As you may know, an incomplete is meant for medical situations, but what it means is that there's no grade being posted until a certain deadline when the situation gets rectified between the professor and the student. And if you have an incomplete, but then you do whatever is necessary and then it turns into a B, then it's a B that sticks on your transcript. The incomplete goes away. It never counts for anything. So the last thing I'm going to say right now, just so I can urge you to trust my trust in you. If there's a big surprise Sunday night, you're not going to suddenly 
if you with, you're not going to suddenly find out you got a D or an F if there was no warning of that. Now, I mean, some of you might because maybe there is a, have been a warning, but out of nowhere, that will not happen. If that's about to happen, you're going to get incomplete. And that means you respectfully and humbly reach out to me and say, what's the situation? And then I say to you, okay, this is what we need to do. Okay. And you'll give you a chance. Okay. So that's my last. Okay. No. So, so now, well, I, okay, wait now. So some people have just come in. I'm going to have to say, because we're really rushed today, if there's anything that anybody missed in the last 20 minutes, I said, I'm going to have to urge you just to stay to just rewatch the video. I kind of am saying a lot about grades in the final and how that all works right now. I actually don't have time to repeat it now. So please rewatch the video, but I will all, and I mean that respectfully. Um, but the other thing is, I, with the questions from the practice test today, I can't, I don't have time to explicitly go over them. All the, the fact that you got advanced notice on them and that you worked together today and maybe got whatever feedback you got from one another is, is all the advanced lead that I can give you on all that stuff. The one thing I, I, I'm not literally handing out answers to that stuff, but I'm also tell for good or for bad. We don't have time for that, but I will also tell you that those questions that, that just like I promised you at the beginning of the semester, whenever I hand out answers, or solutions, then that means I change the question somewhat, like I did from the midterm practice to the real midterm. On this one, I'm not giving you out full solutions or anything like that, but also I'm not going to change the questions really. Like whatever you saw today is what you have to do. So just consider it like that you had that much more time to think about it and work it out with other people. And you can still talk to other people. Um, and anything I say today that's helpful, hopefully will be helpful. But I will tell you that that E-field question, for example, is literally the one we did. There's literally a video for that that we did just with different numbers. And you should replay the video. Also, lastly, on all that stuff, I'll also say this too. I encourage you heavily, all of you, to go back to the YouTube playlists from like last semester and the semester before. Because actually, honestly, I'll bet you that every one of those problems somewhere or another, I did go over some point at some semester. And you're welcome to watch or poke around to find whatever you can find for that. Um, that's the best thing I can say yeah, at this moment. Uh, okay, and but, all right. The, again, I don't, I'm intense, but I don't mean to be stressful. I just mean to be intense today. The thing I'm gonna do right now, before I get rolling on the physics, and again, and just know again, when the last moment comes, you've been a great group. You've been an unusually great group. You have. The the tie goes to the runner, so to speak, like that's a baseball metaphor, but you will be given every benefit of every doubt possible. Every point that I can add to your score from anything you did in home, and all points I still owe you on homework and stuff, believe me, not only they're going to be counted, but they'll be counted generously. If there's something that I still haven't graded of yours, which is true in a lot of cases, believe me, you'll get the most generous grade possible. We are, look, anything you give me to help you help your grade, I'm going to help non-linearly. Okay. I promise. But you obviously there's still an opportunity for you guys to do your part as well. You the thing to just always remember is you're not in a competition. I don't have a limited number of A's to give out. That's the it doesn't mean you're all going to get an A, and it doesn't mean that some of you aren't going to get a D or an F. But we're doing everything we can up to the last minute to see you do as well as possible. Now, the thing we're going to do right now, besides let in Dennis, you're going to do right now before we go any further is make sure that this. Uh, exam thing can be seen because I do understand. Okay, so look for it now. I think I just changed the setting. Oh, I might have to make a new link, maybe. Uh, to, try right now, please, the multiple choice, uh, the true false, and see if it's accepting. If it, if you see the questions now, if you don't, it means I have to make a new link, and I will right now. Hold on. Um. Uh, hello, hello. I see it. Okay, you see. Oh, great, great. Okay, okay, great. So again, even there, those are the real deals. I may, and they're in order sort of of the course material and sort of of more or less what I'm going to go over today. I might change a couple to make it more relevant today, but basically that's what you're going to see tonight, okay? Um, so just have that in front of you as we talk. And if you have to come in and out of the room while I'm blasting forward, if you have to print something out, obviously just you do so and use your judgment and you can replay this video, you know, later to, oh, it, wait, oh, what did someone just say? Hold on, hold on. 
Wait, I have a question. Oh, you have to refresh. Okay, you have to refresh. Yeah, thank you, Allison. What, uh, Chris? Sorry, what? I have a quick question. It gives us option to record our emails so it, we can email our responses. I know that you said we don't have to submit it, but can we, like, click that option and submit, like, at the end so that we have our answers in our emails in the event that we were listening while you were talking and filling them in? I mean, if I understand... You can. I can't promise I will do anything with it. Like, I'm as rushed. No, no, no. As oh, but no, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that you should look at what we did. I'm just saying that so that I have what I selected in my email. Oh, yeah. Then, oh, that uh, makes I, sense. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, sure. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And by the time I posted tonight, so I hope everybody heard that. And when I posted tonight, even though, again, I think the questions will be remarkably similar, like it will say the real thing instead of the practice. Like it'll be a, technically a different document with a different link. And it'll probably have a different color. And again, just to warn everybody, the order of the questions might be scrambled just so that we don't like idiotic, you know, just like copy TF, TF, TF. But yeah, you can totally do that. Yes. Okay. All right. So in a minute, I'm going to close. Oh, so close. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Bradley. And thank you, Allison. Uh, oh, thank you, Dante. All right, all right. Cool, 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 cool. All right, I'm glad. So, so, I know this is a lot. All right, so there's a hang. So you got two minutes. Okay. Um, so again, I'm going to take a deep breath. I hope you do too. Again, I hope it, I hope it's clear that, I mean, you know, and this happens every single, you know, I'm always like this on the last day because I really do, think there's a punchline of the, all of this that's worth your seeing. And, uh, oops, sorry. And I'm particularly like this at the end of a five-week course. I, I really admire all of you for being able to keep up with this pace and everything. The pace crescendos today. I'm stalling slightly and taking a breath slightly because once I start, it will be a little intense. You can walk out at any time, of course, but let me keep going. I don't think there'll be a break today. I apologize for that in advance. Um, What was... uh. But I think that when you get to the end, you'll know if when I get to the end, you feel like I've gotten to the end of something, even if it you're like, wait, I didn't, whoa, that was something, but I don't quite, whoa, I don't quite know what that was, but that definitely was, you know, like the last page of something, then, then you're with me. It will, you will want to walk away and think about it and maybe play this video again and again later after I'm done. But okay, okay. I'm just looking at the chat, but we're going to, so yes. Okay. The form right now. Yeah, so the form right now is practice. You're not turning it in. It's not for me. It's for you. But what it really is, is your ability to, I mean, your guide to following this last lecture. You want to try, like you use this last lecture as like a treasure hunt of when you're, how to listen to me is to try to get answers to those questions while you're listening to me. And then the final real thing that will be posted pretty much when this lecture is over will be remarkably similar to that, probably just with the order scrambled. Um, okay, so, so I'm, I'm going to start in a minute, and it's just going to be like a physics blast. Can I just get consent, so to speak? Can I, and again, when we're all done, you can text me or email me, uh, maybe not right at the end, because then I have to post your exam, but like, you know, we'll still have tonight, tomorrow, you know, Friday, you can text or email me with questions, blah, 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 you could still work together. And then you turn in all your exams by Friday night. Okay, so Dante, so I think Dante's answering the question. Now. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. I didn't even finish. Great. Okay, thank you. So can everybody, any, if you basically get what's going on and you're ready to go for this last class, can you please raise your electronic hand or do like what these guys are doing in the chat? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I totally appreciate it. Okay, great. And you really are a great class. Okay, awesome. Oh, I like the, yeah. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right, cool. You guys are a very cool group. And please come to me for recommendations when this is all over. I'm not kidding. And please don't be a stranger. I live on the fourth floor um, on Tuesdays. Okay. All right. So I'm going to switch the view, the screen. Start. Oh, be fine. Okay.
Okay. Before I do any physics, I'm going to remind you of a little piece of math background that came up in the second homework that's been coming up lately. I want to remind you that there's three ways, or I want to tell you that there's three ways to do multiplication when vectors are involved. Okay. Um, one way is to take two vectors and multiply them together in a manner, whoa, hello. Mm -hmm. One way is to not be incorrect. One way is to take two vectors and multiply them together in a manner that produces a scalar, right? And this is called the scalar product of two vectors or the dot product, right? Now, we just used this um, recently and we used it at the beginning of the course uh, we use it when we count, when we do the dot product of force times displacement in order to get work. And we do it when we do the dot product of electric field times area vector in order to get flux. Just rem right. The point of the dot product, it's one of three ways to do multiplication when vectors are involved. The dot product takes two vectors, multiplies them together in a manner that gives you a scalar, right? And the, so, and the way it does that is it, it it measures the extent to which, or it counts in its multiplication, the extent to which the two vectors are parallel. In other words, it gives you an answer to the product of two vectors that doesn't have direction. It just gives you a scalar answer because it is a method designed to, to, um, to treat the vectors as though they did not differ in direction. It only multiplies, like the way I just wrote this here, A, B, cosine theta is a way of saying we're going to, instead of just straight up multiplying the size of one vector by the size of the other vector, we're going to multiply the size of one vector by the size of the component of the other vector that is parallel to the first one, right? We're all, it's almost like saying we're going to multiply one vector by not the other vector, but by the size of the shadow that the other vector would cast on the first vector if like a light source were right underneath it. Maybe that helps some of you, maybe it confuses you more. But the point is with the dot product, we multiply parallel components. We're only asking the extent to which, um, we're only asking the extent to which the two vectors are parallel. So the more parallel they are, the higher percentage of the whole answer um, we count, right? And that's what cosine does for us. If theta is zero, the cosine is one. So we get a full bodied 100% of the product. If if theta is 90 degrees, cosine is zero. So we get no product whatsoever. So I'm just repeating for the last time, when you multiply two vectors in a manner that produces a scalar, you multiply the extent to which they are parallel. You multiply the extent to which they are not, the, you multiply the extent to which direction is not playing a role in their relationship. That's, so that's one way to do multiplication when vectors are involved. That in theory, we already know and we're using in this, right? Another way to do multiplication when vectors are involved, we also know, you just might not remember it offhand, but another way is we can multiply a vector by a scalar. Actually, we have talked about this a lot. And when we do that, we obtain a new vector, right? In other words, like the scalar uh, A times the vector B um, produces a vector, um, produces a new vector whose entire length is now a b but points in the same direction as the original right when you multiply a vector by a scalar you're just taking an arrow and scaling it up or scaling it down by a certain amount so so far we have you can multiply two vectors together and get a scalar or you can multiply a scalar by a vector and get a vector right which we've done many times in this class such as the electric field itself like the electric field itself is a scalar multiplied by a vector, right? 
So it's a vector produced by scaling up or scaling down a vector. But now when I want to tell you that sort of came up on homework too, but we never explicitly used or, or anything yet, the third method, the third way multiplication can happen when you have two vectors, the third way, if you have two vectors, a two arbitrary vectors, a like, you know, arbitrary lengths and arbitrary angle, and they're separated by an angle theta, we there's a way in which we can multiply these two vectors and obtain a vector. That's the last fine. Logically, that would be the last remaining option, right? We've never discussed this before. Let me be very clear. I'm telling you now. There's a method where you can take two vectors together and multiply them in order to get a vector. Now, how does that work? Well, this is called let's say you multiply these two vectors together in order to get some new vector that we call C, some new vector that we call C. Okay. When you multiply two vectors together to get a scalar, we call that the dot product. And we like denote it with just like a dot, like on the other page. But when we multiply two vectors together in order to make a new vector, we denote it with a cross symbol, like, you know, the, the X. We call this the cross product. What do we get when we cross two vectors? Well, I will tell you that the magnitude of the answer we get Okay, the magnitude of the answer we get will be what you maybe expect if you're following this along already. It will be the magnitude of one vector. And remember, whenever I write a vector by itself, I mean, when I write a symbol by itself without the arrow above it, I'm talking about its raw magnitude, right? I'm talking about the absolute value of the vector, right? So, so over here, just to remind you, when I wrote the dot product, I was saying the dot product of vector A with vector B gives you a raw number which is the, the raw magnitude of A times the raw magnitude of B times this raw number called the cosine of the angle between them, right? So the bigger the angle, the, the smaller percentage that you would multiply by the A and the B. But that was the answer. The dot product was just a number called number A times number B times cosine of theta. That was the answer to the dot product because the dot product just produces a number. But with the cross product, we're going to produce a vector. I'm first going to tell you what the magnitude of that vector is. Well, the magnitude of that vector is the magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the other times the sine of the angle between them. Maybe you're following this. Maybe you even predicted that already. Why the sine? Well, besides the fact that it's the other natural choice, because, you know, sine of zero is zero and sine of 90, you know, is one, right? Or sine of pi over two is one. So what this is saying is now, if we're going to look at the directional relationship between two vectors, if we're going to multiply two vectors in a way that where we do care about direction, where we want our final answer to include direction, where we are taking into account not only how relatively large they are, but how relatively directed they are, right? If that's our operation, and again, this is the new material right now. Like we, we I mean, it said it in homework too, and you practice, but we never talked about it. I'm talking about it now. Um, if we want to re measure the relationship between two vectors in a manner that does take into account direction, then what we're going to say is, well, if they're fully parallel, if they're fully parallel, if the angle between them is zero, if they're just like two vectors on the same number line, then they are not bearing any directional relationship to each other. Like there is no significant vector multiplication happening because they might as well just be numbers on a number line. So no matter how big the two vectors are, if the angle is between them is zero, then we'll take the size of one vector, the size of the other, and then we'll multiply by the sine of zero, which is zero. We get nothing. In other words, the cross, just like the dot product between two perpendicular vectors is nothing. Similarly, the cross product between two parallel vectors is nothing. The cross product is looking at how directionally different or related they are. So the more they differ in direction, the more direction is mattering in their relationship, 
the bigger the cross product is, all the way to the limit where if two vectors are fully perpendicular, then they are sort of as crossed as they could possibly be. Then they're like on two totally different axes. So we would say the cross product of two perpendicular vectors is the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other times the sine of 90 degrees, which is one. So it would be like 100% of, of, of their scalar product, right? and anything in between. So this is just like the dot product so far, only it's backward, it's the opposite. The more perpendicular two vectors are, the bigger their cross product is, the bigger the magnitude of their cross product is. That's what I'm saying so far. Hopefully you're with me. And maybe if anybody gets, is that a hand? Okay, I think you're with me so far. I can't actually see you, but it, okay, I'm gonna assume you're with me so far. But now, if you're really with me, no, I have to tell you one more thing before I go on, because if I'm talking about cross product now, the cross product return is the product between two vectors that actually produces a vector. So that means what I just wrote on the page here is merely the size of that vector. But I need to tell you something more. If it's a vector, I need to tell you the direction of the vector. In other words, what about, what about the direction of C? What is it? Where does it point? Now, now follow this. Well, I'm going to say something that you may have heard in other contexts, but you might never have known that it came from this or that it was math or whatever. What I'm going to say is, since the cross product measures the extent to which two vectors are perpendicular, right? And again, why perpendic perpendicular is the most that two vectors could differ in direction. So we're measuring the dis extent to which they're differing in direction. So we're measuring the extent to which two vectors are perpendicular. If they're not at all perpendicular, the cross product is zero, it, right? Since the cross product measures the extent to which two vectors are perpendicular, then the direction of the answer should not favor the direction of either vector. What I'm saying is, and again, no matter how fast I go today, you can always say, I can't read your handwriting or please go back. You're always encouraged to do that, all of you. But I'm saying here, this is supposed to be some kind of multiplication, just like two times three is six. Like we just have an operation for that, right? But we're now talking about with vectors. Well, just like regular multiplication with regular numbers, when you do two times three, whatever it is you do to get that answer, you don't do it more to three than you do to two, right? Multiplication is a relation. You put two in the box, you put three in the box, out comes an answer. But you don't, you don't put two any more in the multiplication box than you do two. You don't do an operation that favors or weights any more heavily one of the two inputs over the other. Should be the same thing here. So if our answer is gonna have direction, it wouldn't make sense if the direction of our answer somehow was, in other words, if our answer is gonna have an angle, that angle shouldn't point any more closely to one of these two vectors than to the other. There's no reason that one of the directions of one of the vectors should count in the operation than the other. So the answer that we get will be in a direction that is just as far or, or just as close or just as far from one vector direction as it is from the other. Now, how could that be? How could we do? Well, if, if the answer is parallel to one vector, it's definitely not going to be parallel to the other one, like unless there is no cross product at all. So the answer is not going to be parallel to either vector. But if you think about it, the answer C will always be, so this is a therefore, I'm saying, in order for the answer not to favor one vector over the other, the answer will always point perpendicularly to both original vectors. The cross product measures the extent to which two vectors are perpendicular. Therefore, the cross product turns out is always 
perpendicular to each of the original vectors. This is, it's in a way, it's just a definition, in a way, it's just a math memorizer thing. In another way, it's like very important. Well, it is very important no matter what to both original vectors, um, meaning, i.e., C will point, remember C with a hat over just means the direction of C, right? The unit vector of C, the, I'm, so I'm just talking about the direction right now. C will point perpendicularly to the plane in which A and B were originally found. I'm saying, well, well, okay, sorry, you probably have to copy that. I'm saying if I have vector A here and a vector B here, and I want to do the cross product, the cross product will be a vector. The vector's length will be the length of A times the length of B times the sine of the angle between them. Kind of straightforward, I hope. But this answer C, the cross product of A and B will be a vector. That will be its length. Where will it point? It will stick either out or into the very page that A and B were in. It will be perpendicular to both A and B. That's the way we can guarantee that the answer, that the direction of the answer in no way favored the direction of one any more than the other. It'll be as far away angularly from each one as it could possibly be. Now, the odd thing is, if you think about this, I'm saying for any two vectors you ever pick, I, any two vectors you ever pick, to, just like two points define a line, two lines define a plane. There's a, no matter what two hours you ever pick, you can always imagine a piece of paper going at some angle that that included both of those two arrows. You may or may not have ever thought about that before, but any two arrows you ever are trying to cross are in some plane somewhere, some piece of paper you can imagine. What I'm saying is the cross product, the final vector that represents their vector multiplication will necessarily point either out of that piece of paper or into that piece of paper. It'll be on the axis perpendicular to the plane in which the two original vectors were found. So like, so like in our example here, A and B, here's A and B, the, the cross product C will be an arrow who has the length of both and who either sticks out of this piece of paper or sticks into the piece of paper. If it sticks into the piece of paper, I'll denote it with a little X. Uh, we, since all these things are imagined as arrows, so you, if you think about an arrow, if an arrow were coming toward you, you would just see the tip, like a dot. If an arrow, literally, like, like a bow and arrow, if an arrow were coming towards your eyes, you would just see the tip of it. So we denote things coming at us with a dot. And if an arrow that had like tail feathers at the end were going away from you, you would just see the cross hatch, the cross section of the tail feathers. So anything that's going into a page we always from now on in physics denote with an X and anything coming out of a page, we denote with a dot. And then we put a circle over each one to make it clear what we're talking about. So the only question is, is the vector cross product, the cross product of A and B, is it gonna stick out of the page or in? Well, it, it actually doesn't matter as long as we all follow consistently the same convention all the time, as long as we're, so we keep our, it's all, whether which way it sticks is just a matter of whether we're going to call that positive or negative. So we all make an agreement from here on in. The agreement is to know whether the positive direction of the answer sticks like out of the plane or in. From now on, what we always say is You probably heard of this in sixth grade or something, probably in a physics context, not a math context, but there's a thing called the right hand rule, which just means this. I'm going to do this quickly. Now, this is something you have to practice on your own stuff. But again, just try to get the larger concept right now. I'm saying, and this is just a convention. This is just to get, well, the main thing to get from what I'm saying, the main thing to get from what I'm saying right now is that when you cross two vectors, you get a vector, when you do the vector multiplication of two vectors, you get a vector. 
whose direction is necessarily perpendicular to the original two vectors. That's the key point I'm making. So it'll necessarily point out of or into the plane. Whether it's out or in is a matter of whether you call that positive or negative. How you decide now is this rule, but don't, you know, it, it's, it's the rule is kind of minor compared to the whole, just knowing that it's a consistent rule is the important thing. The rule works like this, here's A and B. I take my right, but this is a rule of mathematics for all time, for all cross products, so that we're all in the same coordinate systems, getting the same pluses and minus answers for all time. We, we put, if I want to do the cross product of A and B, I would put my fingers along A, well, you can't, I would point my fingers along that A vector. This is confusing because the, oh, I can't, I would put my fingers, okay, I put my fingers along A. And then I curl my fingers toward B. Wherever my thumb is pointing, that's the answer. So my thumb is pointing into the page right now. Yeah, my thumb is pointing into the page right now. So here the answer is literally vector C would point into the page. It, it's just, and if you got that wrong, you would be off by a negative sign. Uh, okay. your thumb. Yeah. I, I thought it was your, your middle finger. There's other ways to do it too. We could talk about this after. As long as you're self-consistent all the time and getting the same answer as me, there's other ways to do it too. Okay, okay, okay. all right. Yeah, okay, yeah. But the key to everybody, the whole key point is this, we're just, it's, it's like a really weird rule when you first learn it, but it's very fundamental. And it's just a convention, folks. We're not saying that nature like knows about our right hands or anything, but what we're all really saying is that we're taking advantage of our anatomy, the restrictions in our anatomy, just to uh, like be consistent. So we're basically just saying, whenever you have two vectors, line your fingers along the first vector. There's a million ways you could, like I could go like this, or I could go like this, or I could go, but the whole idea is line my fingers along the first vector in some manner that allows me to smoothly curl my hand toward the other. Like if I line them like this, I can't curl my hand. You just line your fingers so that you can smoothly curl your hand without breaking your hand or doing something hideously awkward. And as long as you line your fingers with the first vector so that you can curl your fingers toward the second vector, the, the, the whole point is that your thumb is always necessarily perpendicular to your hand. That's like really all we're saying. So whatever your thumb is pointing, that's the positive direction of the answer. Now, again, that's a little fast. You can practice that at home or not, or look it up on the, there are obviously lots of tutorials about that on the web. The key takeaway for right now, like again, what does any of this have to do with electricity or magnetism or anything? Good question. The reason I'm telling you all this, the main point of this, and we'll bring it back to physics now. Well, first of all, it's the last and final way to multiply two vectors, which we're gonna need for everything we're gonna do now, but also the key takeaway, The physical takeaway of this, like this is a mathematical definition or mathematical operation that we're gonna use. But physically, what we're really basically saying here is if we think there's some vector in space that was constructed or found by virtue of multiplication, if there's some vector in space that represents some information in space that was determined by information found on two different axes of space, if the information was determined fairly by both of those axes, if two different directions in space each made an equal contribution some, to some piece of information, the only way this makes sense is for the information that came from those two axes to be on an axis perpendicular to both. I'm really saying that if in space, as we're about to see in a moment, if in space, something that's going on over here and something that's going on over here 
together are determining some direction in space, the only way that both of these axes, both these directions are being fairly equally taken into account by whatever the operation or the information function is, the only way for that all to make sense coherently in space is for the information to lie along a third axis, an axis that doesn't favor either of those first two axes. Because again, space is symmetric. Space is the same in all directions and in all regions of space. So there's no reason that if something happening you know, at 30 degrees and something having at 45 degrees are interacting with each other, they cannot produce information that's lying any closer to 30 degrees than 45. I'm ultimately saying when two vectors come together and get multiplied and form a vector, that third vector known as the cross product must be perpendicular to the first two. That's my takeaway here. That's what I'm saying. Now, why am I saying this? Like, who cares? Okay, good question. Well, here's why I care. Okay, recall again, we have this thing called an E field. Okay. Okay, let me be very clear before I go on. The E field was a field, was a piece of information, a vector, ultimately a field line. But in the simplest case, if you look at any point in space, at the E field, at that point in space, what do you find? You find a little vector there. What is the vector? The vector was produced by a dot, by a point source, by like a proton that was over here at some other location, right? The dot, just by existing, this scalar, zero dimensional, this zero, when I say zero dimensional, I mean like a point is zero dimensional, right? And a line is one dimensional and a plane is two dimensional and a cube or whatever, a solid is three dimensional. So you got this zero dimensional dot called a proton or an electron sitting in space. And then you draw a vector from it called the vector R, the displacement. You draw a displacement vector from it to some other location in space, call it P. And at P, we find some E field information, we find it in the form of a vector, right? This is all like a la problem one on the final. Remember that that E field vector here is, is ultimate, it's a vector that got formed how? It got formed by all the information contained in that scalar dot at, at plus, oh, I guess I should call it, sorry, I guess I could call this plus capital. I don't mean to make it inconsistent, right? That plus Q, contained all this information in it, like how big it was, where it was, blah, blah, blah. All that scalar information was multiplied by the vector R in order to produce the final vector E at point P. So I'm saying two things at the same time here. I'm saying physically, the thing that produces the E field is a dot. It's a dot. It doesn't have any dimension and it doesn't have any direction. I'm calling it a zero dimensional scalar it's not redundant, right? I'm saying it, it, it. a proton has no dimension and also it has no direction. 
So it's a zero dimensional scalar sitting there in space and we draw a vector from it to some point in space. If we multiply the vector by all the scalar information, we get this new vector called the E field. The E field is a vector. All fields must be vectors. They have magnitude and direction, but it was produced by multiplying a vector by a scalar. That's electricity, right? That's the electrostatic field. However, you saw in a really brief exercise two days ago, you saw this thing in lab that's actually, it just qualitatively you saw something. It's actually a really big deal. You saw in lab and something that was discovered like about a hundred years after all this electricity field stuff and this gravitational field stuff was discovered. After people were getting used, interested enough in electricity and circuits and all this kind of stuff like you were doing in lab, uh, particularly this guy named Orsted, but then other people all across the world, like Bio and Savar and Ampere. This is in the in this is in the like uh, early nineteenth century. What Orsted found is that if he isolated a current in the lab, if he had electrical current, moving charges, charge flow, right, a, a flow of charge, um, delicately and carefully set up in the lab, he found that, like you found, if you put a compass nearby, the compass needle was deflected. And, and that made him curious, like, wait, what's going on? In other words, he saw an action at a distance that he wasn't, I mean, he might, who knows what he was expecting, but that no one had, like, literally accounted for before in formal physics. And then, so he saw an, a new action at a distance a wire was affecting a needle without touching the needle. So he got a little bit more specific about this. So that's what you saw, I, I believe. I mean, you guys taught, and I'm glad you did. More specifically, he got more clinical about it. And he noticed that if he put another wire near the first or another current carrying near the wire, he noticed, Uh, and you may have heard about this in sixth grade or whatever. He noticed that if he put, now, and you may have to, okay, I'm not going to write all this down. You may have to. Uh, the point is this. If he just put a line of, if he just put a wire next to another wire, and there's a bunch of protons and electrons in the, each of the wires, and he just put them next to each other, nothing would happen. But if he started moving, the charges through the wires. In other words, if they were hooked to batteries and he turned the batteries on or the voltaic cells or the power supplies or whatever, if he started actually not just having charges in the, and let me back up again and say, all wires have charges in them, right? I mean, all wires are made up of protons and electrons all the time. So you put two wires next to each other, you're putting a bunch of protons and electrons next to each other, but nothing interesting happens. But if you start letting the current flow through one of the wires, and you start letting current flow in the same direction in the other wire, and you isolate it from all other effects, and you reproduce the experiment, and blah, 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 you find, he found that the two wires come together, which is very similar to saying, I mean, it's a, a more uh, deeper, more measurable version of the same thing you saw, that you saw one wire that had current in it started moving a compass needle around. I mean, it's the same idea. And it, and it didn't work if you're, if the current was off in your wire but it did if it was on. So this is a new action at a distance, or it seems seemingly new action at a distance. And this is exciting. Now you, right, in other words, right, when I say action at a distance, I mean something is affecting something else without touching it. Two things are coming together without touching, right? And again, you might have heard about this in sixth grade, so maybe you don't think this is a big deal. I don't know what you think, but it certainly was a big deal in the 19th century. And let me go a little bit further. It was, I mean, he set these things up for a reason. So it probably wasn't a shock. I don't think he like, I don't think it just like fell on him. I think he was expecting something like this maybe to happen. And that's why he set it up. And other people in other countries did the same thing at the same time. But, but it is uh, worth talking about for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, if this is action at a distance, what we've now come to understand in this class is when one thing affects another thing through empty space, that means somehow each thing is sending information through empty space to the other thing, 
right? I mean, especially if he started making measurements on this and starting to see, which he eventually did, that the extent to which they came together somehow depended on things like how far away they were or how big the current was or whatnot, then somehow this numerical information describing one wire was somehow getting through space to the other wire. I.e., if this is action at a distance in the way that we now have started talking about physics or we had started talking about it as of that point in history, this must be evidence of a field. Right now, you might say, or, or, I, I don't know what you would say. I, I might say, well, OK, sure, it's a field. But like, really, is this that big of a deal? I mean, I mean, we already know that there's protons and wire and electrons in the wires. We already know that like protons like pull on other electrons, et cetera. Et cetera. So like, it, I mean, obviously, we're playing with electricity here. and We already know that electricity is based on an electric field. So is this like really like a new field? Is this really a surprise? Is this really worth talking about? Well, here's a fair questions, if that, right? I mean, fair concern, but let's be really careful about this. First of all, it's definitely not a gravitational field, just to get that out of the way. It's definitely not a gravitational field, even though each of the wires has a bunch of mass in it, because if it was just a gravitational field, the wires would come together, even if there was no current going, right? I mean, the, pro, the mass in the wires alone would be enough to produce this effect it's so it's not gravitational because the mass alone was not sufficient to produce this effect. I'm not saying there isn't a gravitational field. I'm just saying that's not what we're talking about here, right? Like it doesn't happen until we literally set the charges in motion, until we start a current flow. That's when this occurs. So then you could say, all right, but it obviously it's because the current, like, and the current is like somehow like extra charges in one of the wires or something like that. Well, let's be very careful. Like, first of all, current does not mean extra charges in a wire. Current means that the charges that are already in the wire are now flowing, right? And honestly, they're now flowing. Honestly, what's happening when charges flow through a wire is they're flowing in the manner of a compression wave. Like there's no one electron that's like moving around the whole wire like a baseball. What's happening is each electron is moving back and forth, oscillating in a little space. So one electron's going like this and the next electron's going like this and the next, so then you get this ripple through the wire of charge, uh, like a compression, like a wave, right? Like a sound wave or whatever. But I don't know if that's it, but whatever I'm saying is we're not, when we turn on the current, we're not adding extra charges. We're just setting certain charges in motion, right? So then you might say, or somebody might have said, well, but is maybe that's the deal. Like maybe because in the top wire, like now all the extra electrons are moving in a certain direction. So maybe that makes them more crowded. Maybe it makes like the density of charges per unit length higher because now they're all banging into each other. So like, couldn't there be some kind of effect that all the extra electrons in one wire, since they're moving now, kind of aren't they lumping together more? So sure, all of that could be happening, but here's the deal. Whatever's happening in both, both wires are having current go in the same direction. So whatever is happening in one wire is happening in the other wire. So any argument that anybody would make about this is kind of just like advanced electricity going on would be a very fine argument, except at the end of the day, remember in electricity, like charges repel and, un and opposite charges attract. So whatever argument you want to make or anybody wants to make, about current flowing in these wires somehow naturally producing like some kind of electrical effect. The fact is the currents in these two wires are going in the same direction on purpose. Like that's how the experiment works. And yet the wires did not repel. They came together. And this is the key point. The key point is it's not strictly electrostatic. It's not what we call, it's not electrical. It's not electrostatic. because the interaction is in the wrong direction, literally. And he noticed that, and that's actually what stopped him in his tracks, like literally, like so much so that then he, of course he was a scientist. So then he went like this and others did as well. This was a, this is a highly reproduced, highly reproduced to this day experiment, because this is a surprise. I want to tell you too, what I'm telling you now is something that we, this is called Orsted's 
finding because it literally is a finding. This was not something that someone predicted or like, this is not like, so that you know how to listen to me right now. I'm not saying, of course, you should have logically seen this coming. You might have seen it coming because you might remember hearing about this in sixth grade. But I am not trying to tell you that there's anything logical that, to be expected about this. I'm saying this just happened in the lab and everybody was like, what, 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 what? And so they did it and redid it and redid it again and it kept happening in the lab. So this is a discovery that leads to new theory. It's not theory leading to verification, okay? And that's, frankly, that's the first time that's happened in this class. Like, usually we go the other way around. But here, Orsted was like, wait, what? So he flipped the wires around. He left one going in that direction. And when the other wire going, I don't mean the wires, I mean the currents, right? Like, he, like, flipped the batteries and whatever. So then, and when he did that, show sure enough, what happened was, then the two wires repelled. They went away from each other which is consistent with the first finding, but it's all a big surprise because again, if this was a purely electrostatic effect, we would expect everything to have happened the other way. I hope you understand what I'm saying. And maybe again, as long as you're sort of with me, maybe put a quick yes in the chat or something. If you're so, if big picture wise, if you're sort of with me, please put a yes in the chat. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, awesome. Okay, so what does this all say? And again, I, I mean, I know you've heard all these pieces before. I'm trying to put it together into a story. Great, but I totally appreciate all the feedback. Awesome. So what this says is that this is, this is a new field. It might, it probably is super related to other fields that we know about, but it's a new field. We could call it the, or, like it's a new action at a distance that's doing something on its own. It's an action at a distance that's now being produced not by a sitting object, not a sitting existing piece of mass, nor a sitting existing piece of charge. This is now a phenomenon that seems to be produced by a, an object once it's in motion. Or more specifically, this seems to be a phenomenon that's now produced by flow. That's a whole new ballgame. We could call this field anything. We, I mean, they could have called it the Orsted field. Maybe they even did in private circles. I don't know. Or they could have called it the Ampere field or something. But... As you probably know where this is heading, they didn't call it the Orsted field or, or the like the unknown field or the X factor field. They didn't call it any of that. They took a big leap. They took a big leap and made a big gutsy choice that you know of. And they decided to call this field with a word that had already been used in the in like common. They used a word that already was in like English um, and in conversations for centuries and centuries, but wasn't actually a word in strict formalized mathematical science. What they said to themselves was, hey, wait a minute, here's a new, very, very particular, very advanced kind of field that we're finding out in the lab for the first time because we only just recently have this new technology of electrical currents and voltaic cells and all that. So here's this new field that in the lab we're discovering for the first time we've never seen before and we don't know any math for yet. But then they said, you know what's interesting? There's always been this one other field in life, or I should say there's always been this one other action at a distance in life that everybody's known about for centuries and everybody's played games with and also navigated ocean ships with and all of that, as you know where I'm going. People have always known, like the ancient Chinese, the ancient Mesopotamians, the ancient Hebrews, the ancient everybody, ancient Mayans, the ancient everybody's have always known that for some strange reason, if you have an iron hunk near another iron hunk, they or an iron filing near another iron filing, they seem to uh, affect each other without touching. And since the ancient Greek island of magnet or whatever, magnet, we've called that effect magnetism, right? Now, be clear. Before I write, of course, I'm going to write that down in a second. But I want to be very clear to everybody. What we've always known in life is that there's these things that we call magnets, which are like hunks of iron. And apparently, you make a small enough hunk of iron and you put it in a little base, you know, and apparently it gets affected through empty space by some big, huge amount of iron that apparently seems to be in the core of planet Earth. So apparently for thousands of years, in particular, the Chinese have given us this art by virtue of which we can suspend these little iron filings. And then they like point to a certain direction in Earth called North 
right? So we've had this whole idea that we've relied on technologically forever that we call magnetism, right? And magnetism is this idea that iron seems to attract iron, even iron in the earth through empty space, but nobody, but everybody has used it technologically and made toys out of it for centuries, but no one has ever had a mathematical formalism or a fundamental explanation or, or, or um, theory of it. So what these guys in the 18th century, uh, uh, 19th century decided to do is they said, you know what? We got metal that like charges flowing through called wires and it's attracting this other wire. And it seems like charge flowing through metal seems to affect charge flowing through other metal. And we've always known that metal seems to affect, a certain kind of metals seem to affect other kind of metals through empty space, even though we don't quite know what's going on yet since there's always been an unexplained field in like human history. And now there's this new unexplained field in the lab. They seem just related enough, i.e. metals. They seem just related enough that maybe if we could fully understand this one in the lab, maybe it ends up being one and the same phenomenon with that other one. They didn't know for sure, but it's always the physics style to hope that things are as simple as they can possibly be and no simpler. If we could possibly explain two phenomena with one explanation, we're gonna go for it until it fails. So they took this risk and they they took this risk and they called this thing, this new field, the magnetic field. Okay, and I, I wanna emphasize that again, it's a risk. I mean, of course it turns out to be right, but when I say it's a risk, I mean, they were hoping that if they could work out this formalism here, somehow it would help us all understand on a microscopic level what apparently must be going on with hunks of iron. That was not a suit, okay? And of course that does turn out to be true. Otherwise I like, wouldn't be teaching it to you on the last day of class. But so, Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm just going in the chat room saying, hold on a second. Sorry, I might have missed something in the chat. Okay, no, that was all yeses. Thank you so much. Great, great, great. Okay. So, okay. I'm going to start doing the math of this now. But let me, I'm going to say again in case I forget, whatever. What I'm, what I'm saying is when you have a flow of charges, like if you have one point of mass that produces something we call a gravitational field and it has a math associated with equations and all that, that we know. If you have one point of charge, it produces something called an electrostatic field. And that has an equation with end field lines and all that. And, and the two are different because like one's from a mass and one's from a charge. And so they have different numbers and all that, but they, by calling them both fields, we're saying the same rules apply to both, the same rules about field lines and all that. And the same type of equation applies to both inverse R squared, all that. So now we're saying, apparently there's a third type of field now. There's a third type of field that is um, produced by a new agent. It's not a point of mass. It's not a point of charge. Evidently, it's a flow of charge that's going to produce this new field. We're going to have to now work out the equation and all that. But if it's indeed a field, if we can work out an equation that works and all of that, then we're going to say, if this is a new field, just like the other two, it will be produced by a different agent or a different source. 
But if it's a field, then it has to follow all the rules and all the mathematics and all the line drawing parameters of the other two fields. We're proposing now, or they were proposing now, that there's yet a third field for us to reckon with. And we're going to call it now the magnetic field. We're going to believe that it's a field that is produced by charge flows, i.e. currents, OK? And, and just so I don't keep you in suspense or whatever, at the end of the day, it's going to turn out like if charge flow produces this field, then that could mean natural or man-made. So even if you have one electron going round and round and around, that's like a little, that's a tiny little natural current loop. Like even in other words, a hydrogen atom, if this theory is correct, which it is, like which we're going to develop right now, you know, but if we're going to believe this idea of a magnetic field, if we're going to believe that once charges are in motion, then even one electron going round and around and around, that's a tiny, tiny little natural current. So even the orbital of a hydrogen atom will be a little current that would produce this kind of magnetic field. And then evidently, if we put a whole bunch of currents together, like if we put a whole bunch of random atoms together, like in a plank of wood, well, then we're going to have like electrons going this way and electrons going that way and electrons going that way. So we'll have all these different magnetic fields that are all going to be haphazard in all different directions and probably all cancel each other out and not produce any macroscopic effect. But just so that you know where this is all going, you might imagine that maybe it's the case that certain metals like iron or magnesium or something, certain metals like iron, what they, they might have the special property that maybe all their electron orbitals maybe are all lined up. So maybe a hunk of iron is really the equivalent of a bunch of wires all lined, like a big coil of wires going like this, going like this, and producing one big magnetic field. Maybe at the end of the day, why iron does what it does is because it's a naturally occurring version of a whole bunch of current loops that are themselves all doing whatever it is I'm about to explain. And, and that's the case, just so you, okay? At the end of the day, when I get to all, the end of all this, if you're ever then wondering, well, how did this tie back to compasses or iron? Iron and the needles in comp and the stuff in the middle of the earth and the needle in a compass thing, they are all materials that happen to have. But what makes those materials special is all their electron orbitals are lined up. So all of their the internal little magnetic fields are all reinforcing each other and making one big, macroscopically measurable magnetic field. Okay, it's a slight sidebar, but that's where, that's how this all ties together. But now what we need for this course for the next hour is like, what's the math of this? How does this fit into any, like, why do we care? It's always my, I, I think we do care. Like if this, oh, oh, and, and last thing too, for whatever reason, the magnetic field, I, for historical reasons, it's not designated with an M, maybe because M was already used for mass. I, there's actually a story about this, but it's not worth it. The bottom line is you just have to suck up the fact that capital B is what's always, always used to stand for magnetic field from now on. You just have to remember that. Capital B means magnetic field. And whatever it is, it's a, it's a field. It's a vector quantity. It obeys all the rules of field. So, so the B field must be a field in all mathematical and um, graphical, i.e., you know, field lines in all graphical senses of the word field it's got whatever b ultimately has got to follow all the same rules as g and e uh but b produced by a line of charge low, i.e. current, right? So this is now a new thing. And then again, the demonstration of this, I'm talking a lot, but you saw in the lab, you put a compass near a wire, the compass needle deflects. So, and I shouldn't say that. You put a compass near a dead wire, nothing happens, but you put a compass near a current carrying wire and the needle deflects. So apparently, Flowing charges now produce some extra effect in space that the charges, charges when they're sitting still already produce electrical fields. 
But then when the charges are moving along, then they there's an additional effect that we're now going to call a magnetic field. If you really want to follow me or think of it a different way, you could just say, I mean, and I'm not saying the electric field goes away. Every proton or every electron produces its own electric field. But now if you have a bunch of them in a line and they start marching along, what you have is a bunch of electric fields that are marching along. The, you have a bunch of electric field lines that are flowing along. The lines have to fall into some new formation because they're, just like when you send wave pulses back and forth on a string, like you send a pulse, it goes down the string to your partner, comes back to you. But you keep sending pulses back to your partner and back to you and down to your partner, back to you. Eventually, the pulses start interfering with each other and they fall into a new pattern, right? If you have enough pulses that are going horizontally back and forth on a string, eventually they intersect with each other and make a new pattern. And instead of seeing back and forth, back and forth, you end up seeing like this. It's called a standing wave, right? Like you saw in lab three. Similarly here, if you got a bunch of charges flowing down a wire, they're all carrying all these field lines with them. All the field lines are now moving. They're gonna fall into some new pattern. If the charges are moving at a constant velocity, then the new thing won't, it will be a pattern. The new lines, I'm basically I'm saying is if you have a bunch, and I'm going to look in the chat in one second, I'm saying if you have a bunch of charges, each of which are producing their own lines, the picture of the lines has got to change. But if it's changing in a constant way, if the if it's a constant flow, then you'll get a new picture of lines, but it should still be some kind of picture, some kind of pattern. So the question is, what do these new lines look like? And whatever they look like, we're going to call them magnetic field lines. Let me just see. Wait, okay, something in the chat. Uh, wait, I know, I'm a little worried. Oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, great question. What's the word before field after the? Oh, oh, it is word. Yeah, yeah. I thought the person was like, word, yo, we totally can't read word. Okay, yeah, word. It is word. Uh, sorry, but thank you, friends. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you guys. All right, so the question is, the question is, Wait, when we, okay, someone's asking to be more clear, what do we call when the charge is constant? When the charge is constant, if you just have a sitting constant charge, that produces electrostatic field. I'm now saying if you have a constant flow of charge, if you have a current, I, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but when charge is just sitting there constantly, that produces electrostatic field. Now we're discovering in the lab, like I'm not saying this should have happened, I'm just saying it did happen that when a bunch of charge is flowing along, when you have a line of charge that's moving in a certain direction continuously, we call that a current. And that apparently produces this thing called a magnetic field. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. You might want to tell me about it. Um, oh, okay, thank you. Great, okay, great, great. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna just sort of quick. So I'm gonna construct now the magnetic field for you. This is like a prediction that they made, but then they verify. The magnetic field, it's gotta be a field. It's gotta be a vector. It's gotta follow the same rules as fields in general. So first of all, as you might guess, it's gonna be an inverse R squared field, i.e. the farther away you, we're talking about the magnetic field produced at some point P away from some current i like so you imagine some point p at a distance r away from some current i and our question is what it, sorry our question is what is b as a function of R. What's the magnetic field at that point P due to the current I? Now, the first thing I'm gonna say is that 
whatever its magnitude is, it's going to be inversely proportional to the square of the distance away from the wire for the same reason that we already like found with all the other fundamental forces it feels. Because whatever this effect is, this information has got to spread out all in space symmetrically in the manner of a expanding sphere, right? So it's, or this is a guess, like, I'm not saying this is a proof. This is what they guessed because they had gotten used to fields at this point, but then it got verified over time experimentally in the lab. So like, it is correct. I'm, you know, I'm telling you something correct, but I'm saying first, so it's conjecture that got verified. The, 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 the proportionality has to be inverse R squared. Um, now, now what's R? R, as usual, R is the magnitude of a vector whose... Uh, uh, pure distance is r hat, right? Same thing as usual. Don't be scared. So, so somehow, so field is a vector. It's got to be based somehow on the vector known as r. It just like the other fields, it's going to its direction will be based. Its magnitude will be based on the inverse of the square of the magnitude of r, and its direction is going to be somehow based on the direction of r. W what I mean by that is. Somehow, if you're above the wire, something's going to happen. But if you're below the wire, something else is going to happen, like with all fields. Um, so this is the B field vector will be a vector based on the vector R direction and the vector R magnitude. But what else? Well, there's going to be a constant, as always, just like capital, just like gravity has the constant capital G and electricity has that uh, constant one over four pi epsilon naught. We, Okay, I'm just going to remind you again. Remember, I'm just going to remind you down here at the bottom. Remember, the E field. I mean, we keep writing it, but what you really want to know in this class, the E field, remember, is this. Right? So I'm trying to follow that format or that form to construct, to conjecture the magnetic field. So you got the R squared in the denominator. Then there's going to be a constant before the whole thing. Um, but uh, it's not going to be the same constant as for electricity. It's not going to be the same constant. But so we could call it like K sub B or something like that. It's going to be some other number. But now we're sort of getting used to the fact that like four pi is important because it cancels out with surface areas of spheres and stuff like that. So we're going to cut straight to the chase with the benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of electricity. We're going to make up a new constant and also write it um with a four pi so we can in advance do cancellations and stuff like that. But the only thing is this time, since we're doing it in advance, um, since we already have the benefit of the old field, we're going to define our new constant so it goes straight on the numerator. Remember, E epsilon naught was just defined so that it all worked out like that. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to make a new constant and call it mu naught. Mu is like a little lowercase m in Greek, or it's like an m plus a u in Greek. We're going to call it mu, as in magnetism. We're going to call it mu naught, and we're going to put in the numerator, because that's easier. We have the benefit of being able to do that. And we're and we're going to define it so that this all works out. I'm just gonna, you don't have to memorize this at all, of course, but I'm just telling you what mu naught is, is approximately 1.27 times 10 to the negative, I always get this wrong, times 10 to the negative sixth, uh, and the units are something called a Henry's per meter. Don't worry about that. Um, hold on, I'm just going to keep going. Okay. And so you don't have to memorize that. I'm just, but notice what you need to see right now. Again, I know this is a lot. Notice I'm just constructing the magnetic field in the same. Uh, okay, we can say this. I'm constructing it to model after the same rules and logic of the electric field. Now what's going to go in the numerator? Well, we're almost done. We're almost done modeling this after the electric field. But what goes in the numerator now is this idea of flow, right? Like it's not just like the electricity is based on how much charge there is. This has to be based on how much flow there is. So that means how much, like the, now this is a minor technicality. I'm putting in an L there because that's like how long the wire is because the longer the wire is, the more charge there is there. So that like plays into it. It's not, you don't have to get bogged down in it, but it's true. Um, but the current times the length of that current is what's playing the role here 
instead of the Q that produces electricity, we now have a length of flow producing the magnetism, right? Okay, so I've just filed the model and I'm just about done. Like, of course, this is a guess and they had to do a bunch of experiments to get the exact number from mu naught, but they did and they did. But the only big catch here, so this is an equation and you can, it's almost done, this equation, you can almost memorize it, but there's one big catch. And it's actually, if you're with me so far, this is a big point now. This is, well, a big point is that, wait, we're just about done, but there's one problem. There's well, not a problem, but there's one big subtlety here. Gravitation was produced by a point of mass. So then what the gravitational field was a vector that was produced from multiplication of a vector pointing away from that point times the scalar information contained in that point. Same thing with electricity, right? Electricity and gravitation are fields that are produced by zero dimensional scalars known as mass points or charge points. Magnetism is now a field. It's got to obey all the rules of fields and all the math and all that. But it seems to be for the first time a field that's actually produced not by a zero dimensional scalar, but it seems to be produced by a vector known as current. Current is a vector. Why? Well, first of all, it certainly has length. I mean, it's a line now. We need a line for this to happen of some kind, right? It's not oh, a piece of charge that's doing this. It's a flow of charge. Second of all, it's a line with direction. We already showed, Orsted already showed, we already said, if the wire's pointing this way, then it pulls on another uh, equally pointing wire. But if we turn around one of the wires, then they repel each other. So the direction, absolute, so current direction is a thing and it totally matters here. So the current, the current itself is a vector. The thing, and please write this down some way or another, or and by the way, somewhere pretty soon, I'm, I'm into the truth, I've almost forgot, somewhere in here, I'm in the true false, or I will be in a minute if I'm not already. You might want to look at the true false if I've answered anything, but, but I'm saying now, current flow itself is a vector. A one-dimensional vector is what produces magnetism as opposed to a zero-dimensional scalar. So current is already a vector, unlike Q, which is not a vector, but, but our hat is also a vector and it absolutely matters. Like we are saying that the magnetic field that we would experience right here at point P is a field that would be produced by the information contained in that current vector, but also equally produced by the information contained in the R vector. That is to say, what's happening at point P is determined by two things. How much current is flowing in one direction down here and how far away and in what direction are we from it? Remember, in other words, the R hat vector or the R vector, which of course everybody hates the first 400 times they see it. And it seems like silliness. But the thing about the R vector is it's saying how far away in space are you and in what direction are you from whatever's causing this field. R is always a vector that always has to determine field in every single case because the R determines where you are in space in relation to the thing that's causing the field. And the whole idea of the field is, it's the field is the information over here at some point in space of what is going on over there at some other point in space. So the R is always the connection between those two points. We always have the R vector in every one of these field discussions. But now we have, sorry, now we have another vector involved, which is the current vector. The very thing that's producing this in the first place now, magnetism is now a cur is now a vector. That's a totally new situation. What I'm trying to yell and say is it, this is a field. It's a field that's going to be following all the rules mathematically and graphically of fields, but it's a field produced by a very different kind of beast now, a beast that's in motion. So we have two vectors together, I, I technically I L and R hat, they together have to produce the magnetic field vector. So we have two vectors coming together to be multiplied in order to produce a vector. This is not a dot product. It's not a dot product because their answer is supposed to be a vector. The magnetic field has to have magnitude and direction. So we now have two, we don't have a dot product and we don't have a scalar being multiplied by a vector. We have two vectors being multiplied by each other to produce a vector. This is a cross product. And that makes a huge 
freaking difference. I mean, it makes all the difference in the world. I'm screaming, you can tell, but it's excitement. It's not anger. The reason I had to start the, oh, 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 sorry. And I will get the chat in one second. Oh, oh yeah, the units are H over M. Don't even worry. You don't have to memorize that. They just happened to Henry's, it, it's obscure, but it's true. Yes, don't worry about it. But yes, um, wait, sorry. And is an R in the parentheses at the top of the page? My B is supposed to be an R. That's supposed to be R with a vector symbol over it, just like R the vector. Yeah, yeah, the second choice, the second choice. Good question. But now what I'm yelling about, okay, great, great. What I'm yelling about is this is a cross product. So this means there's a point in space, point P, is getting information called magnetic field information. It's getting information in the form of a vector. The, like field information is always vector information, or ultimately it's going to be a field line, right? But it's going to be like, like, like a directional information this directional information is being determined by this directional information, the wire itself, the current itself, and this directional information, the R vector, the displacement vector itself. The only way the information with direction can sit at P in a way that doesn't favor either of these two pieces of information, the only way that the information can point anywhere at point P in a way that makes coherent sense in the universe and respects the sameness of space is if the magnetic field vector at point P is a cross product of current and displacement, which means the magnetic field vector at B must obey, like the direction of B must obey the right hand rule. More specifically, I'm saying if the current is going, oh, you can't see my hand, right? Sorry, just, just, sorry. The current, where's my hand? Yeah, I've got to, sorry, I've got to turn focus. I hate that my phone is my phone is not appreciating this lecture. I can sort of understand that because my phone has heard this lecture. Yeah. Um, if I place my fingers, which you cannot see, along the along the direction of I, and I twist my hands so that they can curl up along R to P, right? That's what I have to do. It's like cockamamie for me to do this because because it's like a mirror image in the screen. But if I, okay, I think this will help. Let me see if that helps. So if I, oh yeah, that does help. All right, so I put my fingers along I and I curl them up along R, which is the right-hand rule. Then my thumb points out of the page. So I'm saying the magnetic field at P, the magnetic field at P points out of the page, out. So I'm drawing a circle around a dot. It literally, there's a vector at P that points out of the page. Please note, this is what I foreshadowed like a week ago or something. This is why the whole R thing is so weird, but so important. I'm saying that with the magnetic field, there's a magnetic field at P that is there and it's a field and there ultimately there's gonna be a field line there, but it, and it's determined by how far away we are from I, and it's determined by I itself, but because it's determined by both, it can't point in the direction of either one. So this field is really weird, right? I'm saying the field does not point away, like it doesn't point away from I, the way you'd expect, and it doesn't point toward I. It points on a perpendicular axis according to the right-hand rule, okay? And then if you wanna know the, Oh, oh, so, oh, yeah, my thought, I'm looking at the chat. Yeah, yes, correct. When my thumb points toward me, I'm saying that's out of the page. Yeah, like out of my computer. My, yes, 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 very good, yes. Um, okay. Um, oh, thank you. Okay, I'm just breathing for a second. I'm just thinking for a second. You guys are doing well. You're doing well, <laughs> or I am, or something. Uh, and someone back, hold on. Okay, I just breathe for a second and think this through. Okay, um, okay, um, now then you might say, wait, how does this all, I mean, I mean, this is kind of, now this is crazy, by the way, if you're at all, if you've been following me, but now this last point, you're like, uh, I'm not sure if I, if you're sort of with me, like you're hearing my words, but you're kind of like, uh, I need a break right now. I, I can't give you one, but I can say that you probably are following me then because this is a confusing thing that I'm saying. I'm saying the field is just popping out of the page. It's doing something that's literally unrelated to both things that made it, but it's because it has to be equally related to both things that made it. 
That's the way space works. So the only way it could be no more related to one thing than the other is if it's in fact perpendicular to both. That's the nature of the cross product. So it's like, it is like a little bit of a head, but it's definitely the first field that we're seeing where the direction of the field does not point in an obvious direction. It points in the direction that is determined by R, but it is not along R. It's perpendicular to R. That's kind of why we had to grind ourselves and understand what R was before we ever got to this point. Okay, now I'm going to say something else quick about this, but we're doing, we're, we're, we're getting there. I, I'm going to say, uh, am I going to say, is this worth saying? You might say, well, then if the field is going out of the page, why does one wire pull down another wire that's above it or something? A very Like, I thought the wires were pulling on each other. So how are they doing that if the if the pull is not, well, good question. I'm going to answer it quickly. If you don't care, then the thing I'm about to say, if it doesn't work for you, just skip it. But I will say, remember, remember with E fields, the whole point of the E field was that by definition, it was the net electrostatic force per charge. Therefore, the force that's produced electrically on some charge equals the charge times the E field, right? I mean, I'm just reminding you of that. So, how, what a field does is it exerts a force onto the kind of object that can receive it, i.e. a charge. Well, similarly, if all of what I'm talking about here is a field, so again, I'm saying here, I'm saying the B field looks like this. This is the B field. That's the B field. How does it make a force? Like, how does it affect some current? Well, similarly, the force, the magnetic force on some current length IL would have to be the current length times the field, right? Just like electrical force is electrical charge times electrical field, then magnetic force would have to be plugged back in, the, it would have to be electrical current times a magnetic field, right? same logic, but magnetic field is a vector and current length is a vector. So again, this would have to be a cross product. So what I'm saying again is that actually what it turns out is what Orsted saw in the lab. I mean, this is wild and I don't expect you to grasp all of this at once, but just follow. The main theme I'm saying right now is magnetic fields are perpendicular to the things that produces them. That's the key point right now. And ultimately, if you have two currents in the lab, then one current here, if you look at a point right in between, if you look at a point right in between, uh, so like a, dis a, a displacement R away from the first current, if I put my hand, if I, if I put my hands along the first current and I curl my fingers down to point P, then I find that there's magnetic field pointing into the computer monitor, into the screen, into the page. So that would be like a little X, like an arrow going into the page. So magnetic field there, point B, would go into the page. But now if I want to know what effect that has on the other wire, this is another cross product. I would go to the other wire and say, put my hands along, oh, you can't see, put my hands along the other wire then curl my fingers into the direction of that X. Curl my fingers into the page because the magnetic field is into the page. I curl my fingers and my thumb now points up. So I'm saying the first wire produces a field that goes into the page, bizarro. Then the second wire, because there, it's in a field, like the second wire is in a field that's everywhere going into the page, but the field is going into the page but the field will produce a force on the second wire that pulls it up. There's right angle and then another right angle and it all works out so that the two wires pull toward each other. Now that's a lot of information. The key point right now, the key point is magnetic field lines and this all is correct. I mean, it turns out they had to verify it all, but it's correct. So magnetic field vectors and ultimately magnetic field lines do exactly the same logic as electrical field lines, but they, they follow the every bit of logic that follows from a flow of vector causing them rather than a dot causing them. So here, now I'm going to say something now more. 
this might put it all really in perspective. Or what I'm about to say is really the important thing. If I'm going to look at a wire again, let's look at another wire. If I, if I look at a point above the wire, like if R is above the wire, from the logic I'm saying, I put my fingers along the wire, along the current and I curl them up, then my thumb points out of the page. So I would have magnetic field pointing out of the page above the wire. If I look at a point below the wire, like we just did a second ago, if I look below the wire, so I put my fingers along the wire and I curl, sorry, and I curl my fingers down below, I, you know, so I'm always crossing current with R. That's what I'm doing every time. If I put my fingers along I and I curl down to R, then my thumb now points into the page. So below the wire, I'd have a magnetic field line pointing into the page. Above the wire, it would point out. Below, it would point in. That's not a contradiction or anything. It's surprise, maybe surprise, but it's true. And I think it's logical. And again, if, it, if anything I'm saying seems weird, if you thought you understood electricity kind of at all, and now suddenly this is like, wait, what? The theme I'm saying over and over again is this is all the rules of field as they would crank out if what's producing the field is a vector of flow rather than a dot of, of, of charge. That, that It makes all the difference in the world because now follow this. If I pick, I can't draw it, but if I picked a point in front of the wire, like popping out of your screen, if I looked at the point like, like, like right in front of the wire on your computer screen, and I want to know what the field is doing there because I can look anywhere, right? Field goes everywhere in space. If I looked at the point in front of the wire, I would do the right end rule again. I would um, put my fingers along the wire and I'd curl my fingers out of the screen, which you can't really see. And my thumb would point down, right? Meaning in front of the wire, the magnetic field vector would point down. And same logic behind the wire, the field vector would point up. What does it, what am I getting at? I'm saying if you would go point by point and just apply this cross product or this logic, however you want to do it, if you go around the wire and go point by point, what you find is the magnetic field vectors and, and therefore the magnetic field lines, what they do is they encircle. And you, I'm sure you've seen this before in pictures. They encircle. But let me do that in a different color. The magnetic field lines, not the electrical field lines, the magnetic field lines circle, loop around the wire. And anywhere I look, this will be true. And as I get farther and farther away, I get bigger and bigger circles. I'm saying, what I'm ultimately saying is, a dot produces electric field lines that burst out like radii. A flow, an arrow, a vector, produces magnetic field lines that loop around the flow. Well, I'll write that right now. I'm saying, Magnetic field lines necessarily always form closed paths. This is unlike electrical field lines. They, they look completely different. Is what I'm saying. not completely different, but they look different. Um, around a long straight current B field lines are circles. So I'm saying in general, magnetic field lines can be very complicated, just like electrical field lines. They don't have to be perfect circles or perfect anything, but they're always closed paths. They're always loops of some kind. And in the simplest possible case of a long straight current, the magnetic field lines will be circles flowing around the uh, looping around the current flow let me say that again I, I, so. Whereas E field lines, remember, they always start at positive and then they go and they either go to negative or they go to infinity or they cut. E field lines are rays, right? And they either stop or they don't, but they they they, they, they radiate, they emanate. E field line from a point goes, 
Magnetic field lines don't do that. Magnetic field lines don't start anywhere ever, and they don't end anywhere ever. They're always loops because they're being caused by flow. And again, remember, the whole idea of field lines is field lines are information. They are the difference that makes a difference. A field line picture is only as asymmetric as whatever source caused the field lines, right? Field lines are as simple and symmetric and smooth as they can ever be given whatever the complexity of the source is that caused them. So another, even if you're not following all this math or even if you hate the cross product of the vectors, in a way, take a step back. And all I'm really saying is, look, the simplest possible picture that could respect the symmetry of space from a dot is a bunch of lines going out everywhere in the same direction in the same way from that dot, right? Like that's the most symmetric picture you could po I could possibly imagine of what space would experience if I put a dot in space. Now, what we're talking about is what's the most symmetric picture we can imagine from an infinitely long or a super long flow of vector in space? Well, the lines can't emanate radially from that. They can't because the lines that would come out would not in any way capture whether the current was going one way or the other. Put another way, you could have a line of static charge sitting on a table. A line of static charge sitting on a table would produce a bunch of spokes coming out of it. I could imagine that, but that would be static, like a bunch of protons just sitting there. In fact, let me even... If you had a stat, sorry, if you had a static line of charge, so be very careful about what I'm saying, not flow, uh, not current flowing through a wire, but just a bunch of protons like in a linear formation sitting on the lab table, then for sure that electrical field picture would look something like, it would look like what maybe you would expect. It would just be a bunch of spokes coming out of it in all directions other than the axis of the charge line itself, right? That would be if charges were just sitting there. That's the simplest possible picture I can imagine of field lines produced by a line of static charge. But what we're talking about here, and then I'll get the chat, what we're talking about here is the simplest possible way that space can register the information of not just a static line, but a vector of flowing charge, i.e. current, right? We and and if current, we are talking about a current source. If current, current is not just a line, it's a line with direction. So those red arrows that I just drew on the page right now, they might indicate to space that there's a line somewhere, you know, amidst all the arrows, but there's no way those arrows are indicating what direction the line's flowing in. The simplest possible way, and it, it comes from the cross product, the simplest possible way that space over here could know, and, and space over here, and space over here, and space over here, could know that there's a flow over here is if it detected loops, circles, closed field lines looping around that flow. I'm going to say one last thing, and then I'm going to say the chat. No, actually, maybe get the chat. Hold on. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, you said thank you. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. Um. Okay, so I'm saying in short, how either think of this in terms of math, if you like, or just think of it in terms of what's the simplest possible picture, what's the least asymmetric way for space to know, space over here to know what's going on over there. I'm saying so far in sum, a, a point of charge to tell space that it exists by doing this. That's the simplest possible picture for all of space to symmetrically receive the information that there's a dot somewhere in space. But but a flow like this tells space that it's there with flowing, I mean, with looping. And I'm really bad at drawing this as you can. Well, why am I so bad at drawing this? Well, because I'm bad at drawing, but also because if you notice what's really happening here is that now we're forced to take into account the three-dimensionality of space. 
The cross product alone forces us to deal with the three axes of space and specifically magnetism, like literally can't even make, it doesn't make any sense in a two dimensional, in a flat land. Um, so this is just representative as always, but I'm saying these would go on forever. The farther away you get, the you know, the bigger the circles would be and the less dense they would be and all that stuff. But the bottom line takeaway, I know we have 40 minutes now. You're doing great, I, I think. Um, it seems like. What's the takeaway right now? Electrical field lines are radial. They go from sources to sinks, even if the sources of the sinks are infinity. But magnetic field lines are necessarily loops, are necessarily closed paths. So another way to put what I'm saying is... So the last way you could put this, if you want, this is a lot, this is a third way to just try to picture or absorb the, the takeaway. The takeaway for now is that magnetic field lines are closed paths. I mean, I, you know, and I'm hoping to persuade you that that actually makes sense, that we didn't just make that up to annoy you. Obviously, in the end of the day, even if you can't make sense out of it, it's still true and you might want to consider accepting it. But, but, but I actually think it does make sense. I think it's like... Okay, I just, okay. Um, like, when I first saw all this right-hand rule stuff and all these clothes, like, I really thought like, oh my God, like this is out of nowhere. Like, what is this? This is a whole new set of rules. Why is magnetism so weird? What I'm trying to persuade you is that actually magnetism is as unweird as it could possibly be. This is actually the simplest way we could understand a field phenomenon if the field phenomenon was being produced by a flow rather than a dot. It really all comes down to that. So what I'm really saying again is, if you go back to that picture of like you guys in lab three sending pulses back to one another on the on the long string, like you send a bunch of horizontal pulses, crests and troughs back to each other on the long string. They're moving horizontally, right? But eventually if enough of them are moving and enough of them are interfering, they fall into a pattern of patterns, right? Eventually they keep canceling each other out. They keep changing each other so much that they eventually change each other in a constant way. And they fall into a new formation that itself is just as steady as the old one, but different, right? So eventually, instead of seeing this, this, this is an analogy. I'm not saying that's literally happened, but it's an analogy. I'm saying when those crests and troughs keep interfering with each other, going back and forth like this, you eventually just see wah, 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 wah. Like it's a new pattern. It is a pattern, but it's a new one. Same thing here. If you picture a bunch of electrons like moving down, each one of which bursting out with, with, with radial field lines in all directions, if all those radial bursts were moving all together, all like, forever, all at a constant rate, eventually all of those, the, the, the diagonal lines of all those bursts, those asterisks would be canceling each other out and they'd fall into a new formation. And the new formation is this, it's the simplest possible formation that isn't that one. It's closed paths around the line. So what you wanna think from now on is, a charge sitting here produces an E field like this, but a, cha a continuously flowing or changing E field produces this. Now, so what? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a lot as it is, but so what? Well, can we apply our concept, our concepts of open and closed to this? Like we seem to be coming up against these open paths, closed paths, like again and again. And then there's open surfaces and closer. Like, can we do anything with this in the name? Like, can we use flux here? You're like, oh, no. Well, so here, so the answer is yes, we're going to try. Can we apply our concept of open and closed to this new geometry? Like, now the good news is, like, does Gauss's law apply? Well, yes and no. 
it does apply, but in a different way. And luckily in a way that we'll, you'll never have to solve any problems with. Let's consider, oh, sorry, you probably need to read that, sorry. Um, so it says, can we apply our concepts of open and closed to this new geometry? Does Gauss's law apply? Well, um, Gauss's law was all about looking at the flux through any closed surface anywhere in space, right? Well, um, let's consider a closed, some closed surface somewhere in space. Maybe one with a bunch of currents inside instead of charges, a bunch of currents inside. Like, so here's, I'm close. So we have like a current going like that and a current loop going like that. And current, you know, I don't know, and a current loop. I'm just, it's just totally random. But let's say we draw a box in our mind around some bunch of currents or something. I'm not going to worry about the drawing too much because, because here's my conclusion, if you think about it now. So if we want to ask what, like the question is, what is the total magnetic flux going through this arbitrary closed surface that has some currents inside and some currents outside, some currents. Well, the good news, and you might already remember this from seeing the equation written down yesterday and the day before, the thing is this, magnetic field lines are already closed loops. That's what I'm arguing now. Therefore, I don't care what any of these currents are doing, no matter how complicated, any magnetic field line that is produced by any of these currents, every magnetic field line is a closed loop. So any magnetic field line that starts in whatever container I picture, if it starts, it eventually has to close in on itself and come back. Anyone that doesn't go in the container at all doesn't go in the container at all. But any magnetic field line that ever comes out of my container will go back into my container and cancel itself out. Because unlike electrical field lines, which just burst, but magnetic field lines are closed loops. Therefore, I'm saying that the magnetic flux, the net magnetic flux through any closed surface at all is always zero. That is a law. Gauss's law for magnetism is that whatever closed surface you ever draw, you're going to get zero through it no matter what. Okay, hold on. I'm just going to pause for a second. I know you're doing great. I can't give you, but I'm just going to, I'm going to look, I'm just going to take my own refresher at your, um, I'm going to look at your question just to see, uh, make sure I'm sort of answering some of your questions for you. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the questions now, if you haven't forgotten about them, yeah, we're like in the middle of the true false right now. I promise you, I've been answering. I'm not done with it, but I would say we're about in the middle of it and it's going to start. Uh, you, I'm not going to tell you, but if you play this video, I've definitely answered about, about seven of these questions already, I would say. Um, and I'm just looking again to remind myself to stay on point. Uh, so don't forget about these true false. And, 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 they're, and, they're, and again, they're not going to change tonight. It's going to be these questions. And you can talk to one another. Just play the video over and over again. But anyway, so I'm saying now. I'll give you a hint right now for anybody who's listening right now. In the middle, so I don't know which question it is, but it says a long straight continuous flow of positive charge current causes infinitely long lines to radiate straight out from it. I don't know which, I just read one of the questions out loud. I'll say, it, I'll even go back. Okay, just to help. A I'm going to go back one question. A positive point source of electric charge causes closed paths of field lines to loop around it. Okay, people, if you're listening to me right now, that one is, I'm not tricking you. I'm trying to help. That one is false because electric charges cause field lines to radiate out from them, okay? But then the next one says, a long straight continuous flow of positive charge causes infinitely long lines to radiate straight out from it. No, it's got getting those backwards. Those are both false because they're backwards, okay? I'm trying to tell you that right now. Like the point is a dot of charge causes lines to radiate out. A flow of charge causes lines to loop around it to form closed paths. So, so far, what we can say is we have Gauss's law is true. Gauss's law, in effect, means lines burst out of point charges and they cause flux in the surfaces that surround them. But magnetic 
field lines themselves are closed paths. So you can't capture a magnetic field line with a closed surface. That's what I'm trying to tell you right now. I mean, that's not every answer, but that's too, whatever. So how do, how, how do you do, how do we, um, like analyze magnetic field lines. We're not, I'm not going to ask you to solve problems with this, but I want you to know the way we analyze magnetic field lines is we construct a different law that's modeled after, that's modeled just like the Gauss's law, but it's adapted for magnetic lines. Like, look, Gauss's law for electricity is about, it's about closed surfaces bounding unique volumes, right? Gauss's law said, if you want to capture magnetic, uh, sorry, if you want to capture electrostatic field lines, you draw a closed surface and you catch all the field lines that bust out of that closed surface, all the field lines that are caused by whatever dots are found within the volume bounded within. That's what we do with elect to catch electric field lines. We catch flux at closed surfaces, but magnetic field lines, we can't catch that way because they circle around currents. They don't burst from charge points. So so with magnetic field lines, the law, and, and these these are this is called Gauss's law and Gauss's law for magnetism. There's a different law called Ampere's law, which just which looks just like Gauss's law, only it's readapted for the proper dimensionality. This, sorry, this law says. This is called Ampere's law. Okay, this is called Gauss's law for magnetism. Okay, and the first one's called Gauss's law, as you know. Now this Ampere's law, remember we said yesterday, somewhat obscurely, when I'm just putting the zoom back on, we said, oh, wait, this thing's in the chat. I'm sorry, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, oh. wait, oh, your questions are in a random order? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. That wasn't on purpose. They would be in a rant. Uh, that was not on purpose, but it's too late for me to do anything about it. Now, I apologize. That wasn't meant to be. I guess that did happen. Thank you for noting. All right. The questions were not meant to be in a random order, but they are, and there's nothing I can do about it. So you have to look around. I'm sorry. But again, I'm telling you right now, if you're sticking with me here and you're doing the right thing, I'm not going to change them tonight. Like you basically are looking at your final exam right now. And, and the stuff you did in the lab today is your final exam. The only thing I'm going to change tonight is the point values because tonight you're going to do a total of two problems, either the true, false, and one of the three, if I make you do it that way, or it'll be two out of the, you see what I'm saying, but okay, just just know that whatever you're looking at now is the deal. That's the best thing I could do. Okay, wait, no question. But thank you, Bradley. I did not realize that. Uh, wait, oh, and to, hold on. Okay, okay. So yes, there's also a question in the direct chat. Magnetic field lines are closed paths. Yes, and that's super important and always true. Electrical field lines are not. Magnetic field lines are. Also, you can think of what magnetic field lines are the things that happen when we change electrical field lines in a constant way, okay? So how do, how do we um, compute magnetic field lines? Well, we actually look at closed paths. Notice this third law I'm just introducing to you now. You never have to solve with it. I just want you to see it because it's like so famous and classic and important. This third law follows the model of Gauss's law, only it's a single integral now. It's actually easier. It says, look at, and it's closed path integral of B dot DL, not DS. It's not a surface. It's a line. It's a path. It's just like, uh, it's just like, like, like F DX integral means work, which is transfer of energy. This one says, if you look at any, and write this down somehow your way, if you look at any closed one dimensional region of space, if you look at a closed path, okay, the, mag the total amount of magnetic field around that closed path, because that's what magnetic fields do, they cause closed paths. If you go around the total amount of magnetic field around any closed path, you find that it's fully determined by a constant, the magnetic constant, right? Instead of the, and the magnetic constant in the numerator instead of the uh, denominator because we were able to define it so that that worked. Um, but the magnetic uh, constant times 
current enclosed, right? This is totally, please make a note somehow, this is modeled after that first law, but instead of charge, it's current. Instead of electric field, it's magnetic field. But the difference now is with, with Gauss's law, we say, if you look at any closed surface, the total amount of field lines busting out of that closed surface is fully determined by the charge points found in the volume bound enclosed within that surface, right? So the Gauss's law says, look at the skin, look at the, the closed two-dimensional skin of some three-dimensional region. The field lines busting out of the skin, just like water jets busting out of a tent, are fully determined by the dots of charge, just like the sprinklers, within the volume of that region. Now in magnetism, we bring it down a dimension. We say, go to any closed path. The total amount of magnetism around that closed path is fully determined by the current enclosed by that path. What do I mean by enclosed? I mean the current I enclosed equals the current flowing perpendicularly to the open area bound by the closed path, right? Remember we said yesterday, and I am watching the clock, we said yesterday, and you wrote down, a closed two-dimensional region of space is the boundary for a unique three-dimensional region of space. Like a surface area is the skin to a ball, but a closed one-dimensional region of space, uh, like a ring, is the boundary to a open two-dimensional region of space. Like a ring is the boundary to the disk within it. So here we're saying, you want to know the total amount of magnetic field going around some closed path? Well, you're going to have to look at closed paths because that's what magnetic fields do. You're not going to look at a closed surface because magnetic fields don't burst out the way electric fields do. But if you look at some closed path and look at the magnetic field around that closed path, it'll be fully determined by whatever current is flowing perpendicularly, fluxing, fluxing through the area bound by that loop. All right. Now, you don't have to do any calculations with that. Just try to sort of picture that. I'm saying that just like charges produce electrical uh, uh, field lines, currents produce magnetic field lines. This is just a backwards, more mathematical way of saying this produces this, just like this produces that, if that made any sense. So there's one last thing I have to say. We're almost, we really actually are almost done. This is all, oh, oh, can I repeat what I just said? I don't know how long ago that was. Oh, that was four minutes ago, sorry. Uh, I don't know what I, the main thing I'm saying is, you might have to tell me what, the main thing I'm saying is, oh, oh, it's okay, 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 thank you, okay, okay. So there's one last law, and then all these laws are gonna be put together, okay? And we have 20 minutes, we're actually on track here. I'm saying electrical charges create these bursts of information, uh, these field lines, which contain directional and magnitudinal information. Then if you move a bunch of those charges, if you start flowing them in a constant way, then, all those bursts fall into a formation where we get closed paths, like, like circles or loops, okay? And that's a new kind of information called magnetic information. Still field lines, still following all the same rules. But it turned out, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna quickly write those again just so you can have them, okay? Just really quickly, here we go. So we have this. And we have this. And you don't have to solve problems with this. Just try to follow what it means. So this is called Gauss's Law, Gauss's Law for Magnetism. And then and it's all a pattern. Once you get, if you really get Gauss's Law, all the rest sort of like will click into place for you. But you have to think about it, obviously. Um, but then... Faraday, the same man that gave us all this concept of field of field flux in the first place and who really discovered how the magnetic flux works from iron filings and all that. Michael Faraday was actually a Scottish high school chemistry teacher um, and who really was a man who reduced all this to pictures. Michael Faraday was not a severe mathematician. He loved the field lines and all and the flux and all that because he loved the pictures. He was much, he was a real scientist, like a real scientist, not a mathematician, a scientist for whatever it's worth he discovered a fourth law. 
he discovered something that you heard about in sixth grade or seventh grade or something like that. He discovered this thing called electromagnetic induction, which almost makes sense once you've heard the other three laws. He discovered this. Now again, just try to absorb. Look at the right side first. He discovered that if you make the right side, just look at, we're going to go backwards piece by piece. The right side is a double integral again of magnetic flux, right? The right side is magnetic flux, area integral of B times DS, but it doesn't have a circle on it. It's not a typo. The, I'll try to even. This is magnetic flux. He discovered. And I mean, discovered, like, like he didn't predict this. It doesn't logically, it's not, it doesn't logically make sense. It just happened and then happened reproducibly over and over and over again. We're saying on the one hand that if you change electric fields, you get this thing called magnetic fields. Then Faraday discovered that if you have make a big magnetic field on the lab table, if you have a bunch of magnetic field lines coming through an area, an open area, an open area, right? So you make some big, big magnet, some big, some big magnet so that on your lab table, there's big bunch of magnetic field lines, like constant field lines, like pointing down or pointing up from the table or whatever. He found, so that's magnetic flux, right? Now there's never any magnetic flux through a closed surface. That's what this says, right? Through a closed surface, there's never any magnetic flux, but you can have magnetic field lines going through an open surface, like on a lab table. There's no law against that. What he found out, and again, don't try to follow the logic of this because there is no logic. I mean, there is, but it, it, he, it's a discovery. He found out that if you put a big bunch of magnetic field on your table and maybe, and you set up like, like four basic, to say it really quick, you could draw this if you want. If you put like, like two metal rails on your table and connect, all right, I'm going to draw it really quick just so you can see what I'm talking about. But I don't want to get too bad. If you go like this, Okay, if you, oh, and this whole thing is like in a big magnetic field, like pointing into the lab table, that's what the X's are, right? If you, oh, we're about to be interrupted. This is not gonna be good, but I'm trying to make it really fast. If this is Faraday's setup, you set up a big magnetic field on the lab table, you put two metal rails. Hi, hello. Okay. You put two metal. I, I got to Okay. You put two. I, I, I need, okay. You put two metal rails like this. I, I, I got this. You put two metal rails like this, and you connect them with a metal resistor, right? And then you have a metal rod that's free to move back and forth on the rails. Okay. So you've got this constant magnetic field going through through the area. So your magnetic flux. If the metal rod is just sitting there, there's just metal, metal, metal in a magnetic field. So of course there's protons and electrons everywhere, but there's no, there's no, you have no battery, nothing like that. Then everything just sits there, like nothing interesting. But if you start moving the metal rod, if you just move the metal rod at some constant velocity along the rails, what happens is Cut to the chase. If you move the rod, then suddenly current starts to flow th through the whole metal circuit that you set up. And the current starts to flow, like you can measure the current times the resistance in that resistor, you can measure and you'll see there's a potential difference across the resistor. Like if you move the rod, current starts to flow. In other words, if you, and uh, which is, at, in other words, you get a current with no battery at all. This is a huge breakthrough in technology. This is called electromagnetic induction. This is using a magnet in order to produce electricity. I mean, of course, you've heard of this in a way, I'm sure. Um, but let's be very, so it has huge industrial like, like implications. I mean, it turns out that this idea that just by moving a rod through a, a magnet 
or magnetic field suddenly we get electricity with no battery whatsoever it's so huge that ultimately this is a generator this is how we make generators we make power plants and suddenly there's the industrial revolution literally thanks to this it's enormous historically which is why you've probably heard some version of this but mathematically or theoretically or in terms of our context what's really wild about this is it turns out yes if you move the rod you get a current without any battery whatsoever specifically you get a voltage you get an electric you get a voltage, right? You get field through a distance around this closed path. You get not closed path integral of force times displacement, but closed path integral of electrical field times displacement. That's no, that's not, that's not potential energy, that's electric potential, or in other words, voltage, right? That's what that left side is. Ele you get an electric, in other words, if you move this rod through the magnetic field, all of a sudden we get electric field flowing through that closed path. Electric field, electric voltage that can be measured with a voltmeter. And then ultimately, as long as there's a resistor there, electrical current, right? Now, again, that's industrially interesting. But what we're, But what's even more interesting is that moving the metal rod is only one way you could do this. Another way you could do this is just pump more magnetism into the plane and the same thing would happen. You don't have to move the rod. You could just increase the magnetic strength through the plane or you could do both or you could move the whole apparatus. What am I getting at? I'm getting at what Faraday realized was that as long as there is a time rate of change, you see the DDT, as long as the magnetic flux through an open area changes in time, that will induce an electrical field in the closed path bounding that open area. Now that's a lot. But what I'm saying now, we've got 13 minutes left, which is just enough. I, now that's a discovery. Don't try to make sense of it like, why should that be true? Because it shouldn't be true. It just evidently is true, literally. Just try to make sense of what I'm saying. What I'm saying, what Faraday discovered, is it the reason you've probably heard of generators and power plants all have like these moving magnets that go back and forth and that's where we get electricity from? What we're saying mathematically, what the essence of that is, is we're saying that just like the magnetic field line around a closed path is determined by the current fluxing through the area bound by that path, it also turns out evidently that if you change the magnetic field fluxing through some open area, you'll generate, you'll induce, I mean, nature will generate or induce electric field in the closed path bounding that open area. It is a lot of geometry that I'm saying. Forget the geometry for a minute. What I'm saying is that evidently, points of charge produce electric field information. Then you start flowing or changing or moving those electrical charges. They produce a new pattern of information called magnetic fields, which are closed paths. Closed paths of magnetic fields are produced by these flowing electrical field producers known as currents, right? So if you change electrical fields, you get magnetic fields, which form closed paths. Now, this law, electromagnetic induction, says in effect that it goes in reverse as well. In effect, if you if you change the magnetic field, that's flow. So if, if, if you do the same thing, but to the magnetic field, if you've got a magnetic field line, let's like going like this. If you think it's the same logic, really, I'm saying just like electrical current going like this produces magnetic fields going around it. Now we're saying it turns out if you take those magnetic lines and you start changing them, if the amount of magnetic field going through an area or the area or both change so you now have a dynamic magnetic field line it will produce an electric field line that loops around it just like changing electrical fields produce magnetic field lines that looped around them it turns out that magnetic lines that change produce electric field lines that loop around them this law has a negative sign in it the other law doesn't have a negative sign in it. i don't have time i, I can't explain right now get bogged down in why there's a negative sign here, but I can tell you what the implications are. The bottom line is this, and we have 10 minutes. Again, what are you, what should you take away from what I'm saying right now? Oh, wait, did I, 
What I'm saying right now is, and those are, I'm not giving you any more laws, but I'm saying Max, James Clerk Maxwell. James Clark, James Clark Maxwell in 1879 looked at these four laws that I just laid out for you. Gauss's Law, Gauss's Law, Aaron Pierce's Law, and Faraday's Law. And he developed a whole branch of mathematics called uh, vector calculus and rewrote these all in vector calculus terms and thought through the vector calculus and then made a correction on one of the laws. You could write that down or not. And, and put the laws together because what he noticed was, well, largely his program was mathematical. But if you stand back and think about what I'm saying, I'm saying, and here's where, again, these are true-false questions coming up. The true-false questions about like quadratic functions or algebraic functions, or that's what I'm about to talk about right now. And I know we have nine minutes. Okay, I'm going to do this fast, but you're going to have to follow me. Imagine if you have a current that's some function of time, start with, say, it's a constant current, just I naught. If it's just a constant current, then it'll produce magnetic field lines around it. And that and the magnetic field lines are, in effect, determined by it. And then, but they don't, it doesn't have a derivative. It's constant current. So they don't have any, so they're not changing. So that's it. Ma a current will produce magnetic field lines that go around it. End of story. Say the current. Say the current is like some constant time, some constant times t, right? So say the current builds up linearly in time, right? So it has a derivative that we could take. If the current builds up linearly in time, then the magnetic field lines that are produced by it are getting stronger and stronger in time, right? They have a derivative. So they're getting stronger. They would produce electrical field lines that would loop around them, right? But if it's linear in time, there's only one derivative we can take. So the magnetic field lines would get stronger and stronger based on that law, just Faraday's law. They would produce electrical field lines around them, but then that's it. There's no more derivatives we can take. There's no more change, end of process. And if if I could go on forever, say it was a cubic function of time, then like the, the, then the magnetic field lines would produce electrical field lines that loop around them, and then the electrical field lines would produce magnetic field lines that loop around them. But eventually, as long as it was an algebraic function, as long as it was some finite number of powers of T that our current was based on, then we would get a field producing a field producing a field, but eventually the process would stop. But say the current was a transcendental function of time. Say the current was like a cosine function of time or something like that. As you know from this whole course, you can take derivatives of cosine forever, right? So if the current was washing back and forth like AC current does, if the current is going back and forth in a cosine function, then the current would produce a magnetic. So current going like this would produce, current going like this would produce magnetic field lines that go like that. But the magnetic field would be increasing like a sine function, right? So those magnetic field lines would produce electrical field lines that would loop around them. So it would be something like that, right? But then the electrical field lines have a derivative. So they would produce a magnetic field line that would go like that around them, right? And if it's like a cosine function or something like that, these fields would keep producing these fields forever, forever in time and space, right? You'd make a, every field line would be a rate, like a closed loop, and that would make another closed loop, and then another closed loop. And because one of these laws happens to have a negative sign and one doesn't, for reasons I can't go into right now, that means that you'd make a loop, right? You make a loop and then you'd make a loop perpendicular to it, but then, then the next law would have a negative sign. So in other words, you would go in one direction, then you'd make like a left turn. Then you don't have a negative sign, so you'd make a right turn. So then you do have a negative sign, so you'd make a left turn, and then a right turn, you would alternate. So these rings would not ring back on themselves. If you made current 
that was a transcendental function of time. It would produce field lines that would produce field lines, which would produce field lines, each of which is a closed loop, but the whole series of which would not close back in on itself because it would be like a left turn, then a right turn, then a left turn, then a right turn, because the two laws, one of them has a negative sign and one of them doesn't. So these closed, and I know we have five minutes left and we're just about there and you're bare, you're doing great, I think. Um, I'm saying, because apparently changes in electrical field known as mag cause magnetic fields, which loop around the electrical field lines, and then changes in magnetic field lines apparently cause electrical field lines to loop around them and vice versa, vice versa. As long as we make the original source be a non-finite non power of time, if we make the original source be like a cosine function, then we're going to make way, uh, sorry, we're going to make field lines that ripple out forever in space that go out that pulse 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 the field lines will ripple out in space and time from the original source in this case according to all this the field lines must ripple or propagate out in the manner of a wave and Maxwell put those four equations together and solved them, coupled them, decoupled them, and found out that indeed the, the electric field line and the magnetic field line each will obey the wave equation, like literally, like we've been studying in every single axis of space. If you produce fields like this, oops, sorry. You will get, and we have three minutes left. The electrical field line in every axis of space and the magnetic field line in every axis of space will ripple out according to the wave equation, according to the wave equation. And you know from the wave equation, whatever this constant is right here is the square of the speed of the wave Right, and the constant is just those is one over those the magnetic permeability and the and the electric permittivity constant mu naught and epsilon naught. If so, first thing I'm saying with the three minutes left is well, the first thing I'm saying is with three minutes left that that electrical fields and magnetic fields can self induce and mutually and perpetually and perpendicularly self-induced so that the field lines themselves leave the original source and propagate out in space away from the source. So the first thing I'm saying is if force means I push you, and if field means I push, then this now just means push. The push leaves the pusher and it has no push E. It's just a force waiting to happen, rippling through space, okay, in the manner of a wave, obeying the wave equation from our course, and the speed of the wave, if you have a moment right now on the calculator and you want to, or maybe you want to check, the speed of the wave, according to the wave equation, is one over mu naught times epsilon naught, and if you plug in those numbers into your calculator or and square root it, you will find that that number you will find the same thing Maxwell found, much to his utter complete shock. He was already shocked to see that these fields can ripple out from the source in the manner of a wave. But as you might guess, the speed at which they ripple out is the speed of light. So Maxwell realized for the first time that what light is, is this. Light is electric field lines and magnetic field lines mutually and perpendicularly and perpetually inducing each other and propagating through space away from their source. And what I'm saying with one minute left is, remember that any wave is a ripple through a medium. A wave is an unthingy thing through a medium. Sound waves we can understand because it's an unthingy pulse in a thingy medium known as air. What this is, what light is, is an unthingy ripple through a medium of electric and magnetic fields, which are already unthingy. What light is, is the speed at which raw information in the universe updates from one point in space to another. Light is, a, and I know it's 645, light is a immaterial ripple through an immaterial medium. Light 
is the rate at which and the mechanism by which information about what's going on over here gets updated via a ripple through space to some point over here. Light speed is the rate at which one point in the universe communicates updates of any physical kind to another point in the universe. Light is an immaterial ripple through an immaterial medium. That's what light is. This is what light speed is. And, and, and that's what propagations in the electromagnetic field are. And that's the course. So you've been very awesome, very attentive. I will post the exam soon. I will turn off the recording. I really appreciate all your attention. I live on the fourth floor um, at John Jay on Tuesdays. Um, and I will stop the recording. I will upload to this, of course, all, and I'll be as generous as I can with all of your um, hard work over the next two days. Um, thank you guys very, very much.